Everyone's bad. <laughs> Rotten to the fucking core. I think what's amazing about this is I think the show is actually subverting some of my expectations. Oh, yeah, like, like you know, what I loved about it is, like, at the end of the last episode we recorded, we had to predict what we thought was going to happen. And I was like, I imagine, I was right this time, but I was like, I imagine they'll just get rid of June really quickly. And you're like, I think June's going to survive. I think she will be fine. And then, um, I switched that episode and I was like, oh no. <laughs> I yeah. was right and Bo was wrong. And Bo was wrong, but the, the concept of time, we'll get into it. But once again, less than 24 hours missing, did you see the state of that body? Dude, there is a point. <laughs> that we'll get to it in a moment. Uh, by the way, welcome to Duncan and Bo Come Correct this season. Oh, Duncan and Bo <laughs> Slash Fiction. Starting right off the bat talking about the show Slasher. That's unusual for us. Hot fit, isn't it? Right but, in there. <laughs> We'll, we'll get to the meat of this here in a minute, but the thing that really surprised me uh, about this, and, and, and to your point about the, the time jumps in the show Slasher, there was a point where after she dies, they cut to Cam, and I mm -hmm. was like, oh, is this her funeral already? I thought it was a week. Yeah. I genuinely I, thought it was a week, and it, it had been it, less than 24 hours from the, you know, you've brought nothing but murder to this town conversation. I was like, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, oh, we'll get to a all flat that. Circle Boran still, it's a flat circle, um, flat circle of nonsense and inconsistency. I, I as as my co-host mentioned, Ambo Ransdell with me as ever the the plucky uh, Duncan McLeish. Hi, uh, we are. Look, here's what we didn't always talk about bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Not on this show. Sometimes we no. talk about really good stuff. We talked about the third season of Twin Peaks. Yes. Which is, is perhaps one of the greatest things that has ever been put to film. Yeah. We, we've talked in the past, we talked about like the first two seasons of Westworld, mm -hmm. which even at their weaker moments were still infinitely interesting conversations. But Ransdell, we talked about not only season two, but season three of True Detective. And one or two really good episodes of the x-files yeah a couple of them and <laughs> yeah so it, it you know doing slasher is a bit of a goof admittedly but well, you know what we're getting listen we said at the front up front we both watched that first episode and we were like this is prime for ridicule i just didn't yeah. realize they were building a whole season around that i thought at some point it would actually start to i don't know kind of change tone change tact and not they are they, I, what i love about it is they are doubling down hard well now you thought this was dumb well wait till you see this hold my beer yeah it it's it's one of those things like you know how uh sometimes you hear somebody say something and it sticks in your craw but you don't realize how true it is until a little bit later yes and it was a <laughs> comment uh on one of these here very shows duncan where someone said, oh, Duncan still thinks this is a real show. Yes. And at the time I thought, oh, that's that's quite droll. How very funny. And now here we are on episode five and I'm like, oh, no, I there is. That's right. This yes, just is <laughs> like th this kind of looks like a real show if you squint at it. But then yeah. at a certain point you realize like, oh, no. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a soap opera is what I've realized. Is he soap opera? Like every episode finishes with a character kind of, you know, mischievously smiling to the side or someone getting knocked off off camera. So it's basically a soap, it is a condensed soap opera into eight episodes, kind of ticking the boxes of things that have happened in much better slasher movies. Yeah. So. Well, we'll get to I'm all that in a minute. But yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get to it. before we get into episode five of Slasher. Th first of all, thanks for being here. Uh, th thanks for saying hey in the chat and all. Um, mm -hmm. So before we get started, what we like to do around here is we like to talk about a movie, good and bad, that we've seen over the course of the past uh, couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I guess uh, I don't I don't know if I, I in fact I know I didn't say this in the upfront I might as well say it right now. Uh, speaking of the last couple of weeks, we've kind of you know more stumbled into than meant to uh, fall into sort of a biweekly schedule here of late with the video stuff. And so yeah. Duncan and I were talking about it, and I and 
so I think just moving forward, I, I, that's kind of our plan, barring anything unforeseen. And uh, the way we're going to do it is you're going to see the live episodes uh, every other week. And then a week after the live episode, you're going to get the audio version. Uh, so if you don't watch the live thing, uh, you know, you're still going to get the show and all that, of course. But uh, if you want to join us live and, and chit chat and whatnot, uh, that's always a blast, too. So it's a great way to kick off your weekend because it's early America time and it's it's boozing time UK time. Yeah. So take a drink. <laughs> let the let the folks know. I don't know that we can do that on on YouTube, but try. Can you can you drink? I'm sure you can. I'm uh, I'm sure I, we'll find out in a second. Does that mean blurred out? No, I don't. Mm. What technology do you think we're working with here? I have no idea. Up until up until like a couple of months ago, this was purely audio based, and they couldn't see our faces. Right, we didn't have uh, the the American and and Scottish flag backgrounds waving behind us majestically. Yeah, but also, also, like, I'm just like convinced at this stage that you filmed like a crashed UFO, like Roswell style, and that can only explain the vast increase in technology used to produce and put out this show in the last like two months. So, <laughs> I've, uh, yes, there's a lot of dark magic at work. Um, mm -hmm. and, and speaking of dark magic, Duncan, yes, let's, let's talk about our good and bad and, <laughs> Uh, I kind of want to start if if I could. Oh, please do with with my bad. Yep, and, Give me <laughs> and it's not terrible. And but I saw that movie Shook that premiered. Yeah, on I watched Shutter. it as well. Yeah, and I know you did, and I didn't listen to your review kind of purposefully because I, I wanted to have this conversation with you. And so here's my total take on it because I almost did a review myself, and I was like, you know what? I don't know that I feel strongly enough about this movie one way or the other that that I feel like I could give an impassioned review um w where I came down on it I think it is well directed I think it, it has some very cool representations of how do you present social media in a cinematic way mm -hmm. that's kind of interesting and then I think everything else about it kind of sucks you did you feel that maybe at some point the script was handed off to the guy that wrote season one of Slasher. It like it <laughs> it starts to twist, and you're like, okay, I I guess I see where this yeah. is going, but I don't know where this lands us thematically, you know? Yeah. And then it twists further, and that's the point where it's like you can hear the tibia snap, where you're like, <laughs> oh no, you just you broke the movie. Yeah, they go. They, 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 I, I'm actually my review. Weirdly enough, when you do listen to it, is is on point pretty much with everything you said, even down to the point where I purposely mention that one of the standout things to me was its visual representation of technology, the fact that it's you know it goes from like text to chat in the background, actually can explain her the background to when she's reading text messages, actually having the person whisper in her ear. Um, I, I loved all that stuff, but the the movie really loses itself about halfway through, and then it just it tries to stumble back any sense of credibility in the last twenty five minutes, and it just fumbles like really, really, really badly fumbles, um, and it can't pick itself up after that. And then that last shot, fuck this movie. You know what I mean? <laughs> Do you want a sequel? No. <laughs> No, I really don't. And also, I don't think that's possible. And two, it's a predictable end. And, and uh, yeah, the laundry list of things just kind of, and it kind of upset me a little bit because I like the idea in principle of, uh, and we've seen it done before in social media horror um, and internet horror. We've seen it done before, but I, I like the idea in principle of what would happen if an influencer, someone who is basically created this fake persona of her lifestyle is actually confronted to face the things that she's neglected in order to portray that false sense of self. Well, this idea that her mother's dying and her mum was dying and she was too busy, you know, getting YouTube likes or Instagram tags than to spend the kind of final, because those are, those are things that don't get you Instagram followers. I loved that aspect. I thought that was really, really cool. And I wanted them to really dig into that. And, um, no, because what very much like the superficiality of the person that you are supposed to at first dislike but empathize with by the end, don't know how we do that. And um, the movie does exactly the same. 
You know what I mean? It's all it's all kind of superficial. It's, there is no depth to it, which is the sad thing. It, it, it puts forward questions that would be quite interesting to discuss, dig into, and it doesn't have the balls to do it, sadly. It would much rather kind of cover it up with nonsense, which is very, very, very good at, so... Yeah, it, and also there's kind of glimpses of like, well, this life is sort of, you know, faking. Like, it, 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 you know, there's that opening with them having this, you know, like glamorous <laughs> paparazzi opening. moment, and then you realize like, oh no, this is just in a shitty part of town, and yeah. it's you know they're staging all of this uh, for the for the sake of social media, and that was really interesting, and then that kind of goes nowhere. Yeah, they, the they don't, and, and that's the bit that I'm interested in. Yeah. Like, like I say, when she's confronted with elements of that after the fact, I'm like, this is really cool. This is really, really, really cool. Um, but yeah, they don't they don't go anywhere with it, which sadly is the frustrating part of the movie. And then when they do try to resolve like some deep rooted family issue in here, it's just dumb. It's really, really, really dumb, and it's it's a it's a shame. I, I mean, like I said at the time, I imagine that there will be a lot of people that will probably think that this is kind of cool and kind of relevant and kind of quirky, but those aren't, I think, real horror fans, if you know what I mean. I think those are people that stumble across to this movie. Um, even on Shudder, I know there's plenty of people out there that are not hardcore horror fans that have Shudder accounts because they like the occasional scare. I imagine that's the audience it's playing to. Um, if you watch a lot of horror movies, it doesn't really do much to differentiate itself out with some quirky techniques used throughout the movie, which, like I say, I really enjoyed. I thought those were very smart um, and hid very well the low budget of the movie. But, yeah, it's not, I, I mean, I, I, will, I will probably never watch it again. I imagine I will have forgotten about this movie by the end of the year. So. I think every time I see social media handled badly in a movie... I'll be like, you know, that uh, that that Shook movie. And yeah. I had the hardest time, Duncan, remembering the name of this goddamn movie. Of, of course, That of course Shook is will. so, like, it, it's just, it's way too generic. It needs to be. I, anyway, it, like, there are so many things that are almost really good about Shook, and that's what makes it disappointing. It's not terrible. It just, it it reaches a, lo a logical point uh that or uh, like an illogical in inconsistency from characters that i'm like i just can't i can't go with this movie to this place this doesn't make any sense and mm -hmm. anyway uh but that's my bad feel free to start with a good if you want but i just i needed to get that off my chest really um i will double down with the the shudder titles um i had um I think it was after our previous recording, I want to say that our, our buddy Alan McPherson had dropped a conversation about, I think it was maybe Rape Revenge um, movies that he was watching, like a group of them. And one that he mentioned specifically was Hunted, um, which is currently available yeah. on Shudder as well. So that night I checked it out because I remember him saying about it and I was like, you know, I've, I've seen a couple of posters of it, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna take the plunge and check this out. It's a bad movie. <laughs> just like really? The, oh, it's kind of a, like a. Movie. I don't know if it's a rape revenge, but it, it it's like a revenge kind of movie. Well, it's, the essentially uh, she's in a dance club at the beginning. She's hit on with by a man. She goes out to the car. She, I think she thinks she's gonna have uh, some sexy time in the car. Sure, that sounds like a good time. Yeah, and then someone gets into the car and then she realizes she's being abducted and they essentially shoot. I, I, it's never explicitly explained, but I, my understanding is it's either like a like extreme rape video, which is for a collector, or it's a kind of snuff movie, which involves you know a lot of sexual torture. And they drive her out there and she escapes on the road out there and they try and track her down in the woods. So she is being hunted. Um, oh, just like the title. Yeah, just like oh. the title. Um, yeah, clever. I get it. And I see where the they're acting going. Is, the acting is terrible. The dialogue is terrible. And we have a woman who spends... <laughs> oh, God. She spends the majority of the movie trying to stay hidden in the woods while wearing a very vibrant red jacket, 
but she never takes off at oh, any so point. Oh, so it's a Red Riding Hood kind of thing. Oh God, yeah, I'm okay, sure. I'm sure it. they're going for like, but it's just so painful. Let me. To watch. This just in from the chat. Breaking news: Alan McPherson coming in saying he was saying it was bad from the beginning. Is that true? Yeah. Did you know uh, it yeah. was bad going into this? Yeah, yeah, I, I kind of had it. Like, I had. Oh, you hypocritical son of a bitch! You, well, you Ouija had, had, experiment and hating <laughs> motherfucker. I no, 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 no. We were talking specifically about tropes of the back of his question, and he raised it as an example of a badly used trope. I got. Um, I, I was like that. I want to. I want to check this out because to me, that I have a, a. When it's done right, that genre can be really grueling to watch, and part of me really likes feeling shitty about men after watching certain movies so i really want to double that but it's just it's not it's not anything that you haven't seen before and and sadly it just doesn't doesn't try and ever really elevate itself out of a very kind of almost in the back of a post-it no idea for a movie and the the, the main kind of antagonist in it is so fucking terrible like just a character in general um that even when it comes to, oh, we're going to get retribution on him when the tables are turned, I just couldn't give a fuck, like, at all. I just, I, like, no fucks left to give for the movie. Um, and, yeah, like I say, just characters behave in a way which don't make sense. Like, she seems, that the woman, it seems relatively, like, she starts to kind of set up traps in a particular way, but... You know, like once again, she's running around with a red jacket on, and I'm like, that'd make like no fucking sense at all. And then there's a twist where, like, we're gonna set up like this boy who lives in the wilderness with his survivalist mother into maybe a villain, and then they can't decide what they're doing with that, and then he behaves in a way which doesn't make sense. Like, try, seeing is believing, but I would say do not see. Um, so I took the bullet for this movie for the show. Don't do it. So there you go. I I'm I, I mean it sounds bad. Alan Alan is uh, again uh, <laughs> uh, chiming in and saying like it's it's not it, it is not good stuff. So it's yeah. not it's not at all. It really, I, I can't stress that enough. It's it's bottom barrel. I, I'm unsure why it's made its way onto Shudder because even Shudder bad movies tend to be of a better quality than this. But yet, if you check it online, it receiving relatively good reviews. So might just be that there's there's people out there that enjoy that sort of stuff more than i it, just like a bad movie i get it i get it uh, maybe yeah like we spoke about this before it's like when you sit down and watch um is it ter- i can't I never get it right terrifier terrified whichever one has art the clown in it uh, ter- people, terrifier yeah yeah terrifier people rave about that movie yeah, and yeah. it isn't yeah, you know, like, like, but genuinely, art's the greatest villain of all time. Modern pop icon, art, yeah, and I'm like that. But where are the characters? Like, where are the characters in this movie? Who am I supposed to root for? Am I supposed to root for art because the movie goes out its way to make sure I don't and I don't gravitate or like any of the other characters who are not on screen enough, who are painfully dull? I think it's. I, I think there is a pre pre arranged audience that just want to see horrible things happen to people on screen, which is cool. I just I like a I like something a bit deeper than that, uh, and this movie could have tried that, but it was too interested in that. Uh, I think the visual aesthetic of like you mentioned before, the little Red Riding Hood running through the you know the woods being hunted by a villain character. I think they really liked that idea um, and decided to make an entire film of it, which you can do. It's just not this movie. The Freeway is a good example of mm. how to remake. Oh god, little yes. Red Riding Hood in a really interesting and weird way. Um yeah. uh Alan also saying check out What We Need to Survive, which I have not seen. I'm aware of that movie and I, I just yet. haven't haven't gotten around to it, but all right. Uh hey, let me let me give you my good though. And ooh, this is right. ooh, this is enthusiastic, Duncan. <laughs> I kind of you I kind of referenced this a little earlier in a different conversation. But I saw Nomadland finally. I know this isn't a horror movie, but everybody just yes. calm down. Um, well, technically, this isn't a horror shit. I, so. I know. I know. Um, but you and I are both kind of in the horror world, so it, it feels We've been like known to watch one or two occasionally. On occasion. Every now and again. I, I'm one of those people you mentioned that has the shudder, because I like it a little scare now and again. 
And uh, so I watched Nomadland, which was on. It's on Hulu here in the states. Um, you, you can just buy. You can just get it. You can just watch it, Duncan. Any old time. I, I, well. I, I can watch it's it right now. Over here yet. Over um, will be soon. When yeah. it is, I will watch it. So it is. Here's the thing that's kind of brilliant and beautiful about it, and and I don't want to oversell it, but also everybody ever should see it. Um, it is. Uh, it, it's the story of a, a a woman played by Frances McDormand who, uh, due to financial and just kind of shitty life circumstances, finds herself uh, at a point in life where her husband has has died. The the place she used to work the is a factory that no longer exists. The town that she lives in has kind of dried up. Uh, it's really just, you know, what used to be a blip on the map isn't even that anymore. Mm -hmm. And so she, she kind of takes to the road and, and there's this sort of loose community of people who uh, travel live out of their vans or rvs or whatever and travel where the work is like during christmas they go to where amazon has big packaging centers and they mm -hmm. work there for a few months and then during summer there are like uh you know sort of tourist trap restaurants and stuff that they go work for that season and the thing that makes nomadland fascinating is that in many cases the characters in the movies are just slightly fictionalized versions of themselves or maybe not fictional at all and mm -hmm. and you know it's 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 like francis mcdormand giving a performance like again it's one of those things where it's not even fair how good she is yeah. where it's like i don't know if she's acting with this person who is not an actor who actually lives this life or she is just connecting with them on such a human level and the acting is the sham of it. And it's really yeah. just almost a documentary that you're watching. And that's kind of the brilliant thing about the movie is that you're never sure what's real and what's art. And maybe that makes all of it art, you know? Yeah. It's, oh my God, what a beautiful film. And, and there's, and it's not just a bunch of random interconnected stuff. It's a real character arc of this, this character, like learning, to, to sort of be able to move on with her life and 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 so forth and it's i mean it's beautiful and it's it's captivating and uh there's not a single frame of it that isn't just like intriguing or interesting and it gets into kind of the ins and outs of living this life and what you need like there's a point where they have a whole class about which bucket you ought to be shitting in and mm -hmm. stuff like that and it's just like Man, it's it's all the stuff you kind of want to know once you understand that this really is this weird kind of subculture, but all these people are weirdly like broken in certain ways. And oh man, just ah, uh, what a beautiful piece of filmmaking! It's really something. It's one of those movies like it'll uh, uh, go on to win Oscars and shit like that, and it'll be like, of course, of course it did. Yeah. Like <laughs> you know, it's like it's like when you saw Schindler's List and you were like, well, that's the best movie I'm gonna see for a while. <laughs> You know, and that's that's how No Man Land was, where it was like, well, I won't see a better movie for a while now. That's that it was everything movie movies ought to be. So I can't wait to see it. Can't wait to see it. She's she's on a tear just now, like in terms of choosing what she's at. Like yeah. she only does a movie every now and again, but when she does, by God, is she incredible in it? I right at some point she and Meryl Streep are just going to be in the same <laughs> film together to see who can get the most Oscars for the, the same great, movie. The Academy, right? Like the Academy will have to death fight to work out who yeah. gets the Oscar. <laughs> it's but I mean it is. There are moments in it where you're just like, oh fuck you, you are yeah. just you're too good to be among us, among us yeah. mortals. <laughs> uh, yeah, she's amazing in that movie, and and David Strathairn, there, mother from uh, from Sneakers. Oh, yeah. is is in it as well and he's very good in it too and and then there are other like i said there are whole sections of that movie that are just francis mcdormand and people who are not actors people who live on the road and and do mm -hmm. these jobs and and it's it's something so uh anyway what about you what i, I can't whatever paltry movie you've got but <laughs> let's hear it there's been a ton of prep happening. Um, to, in fact, this very day, myself, 
yourself and the the wonderful Jamie J. Sammons are going to sit down and continue on podcasts under the stairs looking at A24 movies. Um, so that's kind of been my last couple of days. I've been kind of basking in the glow of, of kind of A24's output, which has allowed me to, to jump back through some movies that I hadn't seen since they came out, so a couple of years ago anyway, and other movies that I had just not seen before. And I, I know we're going to get into more detail about it, so I'm not I'm not going to go into too much detail on it here because I want to, obviously, for, for cross-listening purposes, I want to get people to listen to the new episode when it drops. But um, the, the, the movie by the dude that made It Follows, whose name escapes me, David... David Robert Green, David Mitchell Green, David Mitchell Green Mitchell. Green, I think. Yeah, one of them, all of them, none of them. Some uh, of them. Yeah, some, some combination. Um, so he made it follows, and then he fell off the radar for me, and I was like, oh well, that's interesting. Uh, but he then did do a movie for A twenty four called Under the Silver Lake, and I briefly remember it coming out, but Bo, for the life of me, I don't know why I checked. I didn't check it out. Like, at all. I think it was maybe because I knew on some level it wasn't a horror movie. Um, and that isn't a prerequisite for me watching movies either, which is the frustrating part. Um, I just didn't check it out. So, you know, I got a chance to sit down and watch it. And it's like this movie was made for me. I, I would go one step further. I would say it's like this movie was made for Duncan and Bocum, correct? Yeah. Because um, it encompasses so much I love about like specific parts of cinema it's a, essentially it's a kind of a comedy neo-noir movie um and yeah it plays sure. very, yeah it plays very much in that pool uh it, it kind of it has it has all the sensibilities and weirdness of something like david lynch without overtly trying to be lynchian or you know trying to be it, it just has a good sense of idea of right this is how noir movies should be constructed and we're going to follow one mystery that's going to lead to a bigger mystery but at the same time it's you know it really gets into the idea about what it's like to be in the fringes of LA um the idea of obsession and of loneliness and and celebrity and that yeah. existentialist angst of you know meaningfulness with yeah. your life and it it, it deals with every subject it deals with all of it and I, I like obviously when it finished i was like oh i need to go online and see what people made and the g- general generally it was received not that well uh, which yeah. surprises me because one watch out of it i got so much out of it so and it appears that people didn't like the idea of you know, it just going as broad as it does. It's about, it's just over a two hour movie. So, you know, it takes its time to go to the places it needs to go. Um, and I'd like, I enjoyed that journey. I like the further it went down, Andrew Garfield is absolutely brilliant in it. Like, and I don't really rate him as an actor, if I'm honest. I think he's okay in the things I've seen him in before. Um, and he's always been that kind of, he's in, He's in a movie as a like supporting actor, and I love him in those roles. But as a leading man, I've never been on the front line banging the drum, and he is like jaw dropping the goodness. Um, and yeah, just you come across all these weird, almost Coen Brothers esque characters on your journey throughout the movie. So it's definitely paying nods to that. It's definitely paying nods to Lynch, um, and. There's, there's even a bit of kind of weirdness, a la kind of Neil Gaiman, in, not Neil Gaiman. Uh, what's his face? Neil oh. Simon. No. Neil, Neil Simon's under the silver silver no. light. <laughs> it's a hilarious bedroom farce. <laughs> no, um, oh, what he's you? A a fifty-ish fading starlet who goes topless the the whole movie. What are you doing here? <laughs> what's the, 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 the we spoke about him. Oh, like a couple of years ago, like full show and podcast under the stairs. Did Twelve Monkeys? Did fuck Terry Gilliam? Is that who? Terry you're thinking Gillingham. Of? Yeah. There's Gillingham esque characters that make appearances, like most notably the homeless man that wears the crown. Yeah, the homeless like come, king. Yeah, yeah. It, it feels like he's just come straight from a, 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 a Terry Gilliam movie. How is that um, character not played by Tom Waits? That is a real and oversight. He missed a beat. Yeah, he missed a beat. Yeah, I'm I the homeless like king. Come with me. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, 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 
it's the sort of movie that I felt ashamed that it's not in my collection. So I am in the process of rectifying it. I've actually ordered the Blu-ray because I watched it. I screened, I screened it digitally. And um, when it finished, I was like, no, I want to own that. So um, yeah, it, it, it was a shock and a surprise. I think it has a couple of flaws, but for the most part, it's a really enjoyable movie. Like really, really, like if you're into that genre, which I am, I love noir. Um, I love when people try and make contemporary versions, but try and stick true to what makes those kind of classic noir movies work. So yeah, I I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So um, I, I have you know, to... The- uh give credit where credit is due here alan mcpherson <laughs> chiming in with blake edwards it follows which is a wonderful idea it's like the <laughs> yeah well you know the the monster the 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 it of the movie like his dick would glow yeah <laughs> like skin deep that was a thing that blake edwards got so like heady with success in cocaine that he wrote and made as a movie starring uh everyone's favorite john ritter um, um you know, he's had a he had a, a weird uh, <laughs> a weird career bro. david um, robert mitchell by the way is the director of it follows and under thank you i knew it was so. like a, i knew it was a triple barrel name but so is the dude that did halloween um right so. i get david gordon green i think is that gentleman's name uh that sim- I Sorry. but I do get those two confused be, because look, unless you are going to be committing a series of horrible horrible serial murders, I do not need three names. No, no, I I agree with you. Unless you're going to assassinate a president, uh, I think that's the rule. You hey, have three names. You know what's a totally fine director's name? David Mitchell. David Mitchell. Uh, David Mitchell is a famous British comedian as well. Oh well, that's probably if why. If you've he goes never by seen David it, I will Robert send. Mitchell. I will send you things of him. Uh, you ever seen the uh, the TV show Peep Show? I don't believe I have. Right, you need to get on board with this. He's your sort of comedian, and then some. How dare you? Uh, but yeah, so um, yeah, like I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. So that was the there was only two movies in this rung of A24 movies that I hadn't seen. And actually, to be honest, with the last two movies from their genre output, so stuff that isn't, you know, a uh, family drama or an indie comedy, um, th- these were the kind of the final two to tick off the list. And I'm glad I did uh, because both of them were strong for their own reasons. And that one in particular really, really resonated with me in a way that it would go really, really well. See if you wanted to double bill it um, and have some just because of the comedy and it you could double bill it with uh, kiss kiss bang bang yeah sure yeah and it would work totally, really really well yeah. or uh i would even say the uh the new guys the new guys is a great show mm-hmm. is that is a great you like triple bill it do all yeah. three you got yourself a good sunday you do something <laughs> you have, like you, that give yourself a good hangover sunday where you have you don't need to concentrate too much on the mystery because that's not the point I'll tell you, here, here's the thing that makes me unacceptable as, uh, as a person in society, Duncan, is I woke up this morning, I, I fell asleep kind of early last night, woke up at like 4.30 today, you know, like mm-hmm. raring to go. And uh, so I was getting some, some work done early morning and ended up like, you know, I was going to save this till kind of the break in between recording this and the H24 show. But let's just start my day with uh, a, a good old fashioned Yorgos Lanthimos uh, break. <laughs> so I watched Killing of a Sacred Deer before recording oh, this. Four thirty in the morning. Uh, I probably started at about five thirty. Oh, <laughs> which is a weird way to start your day, Duncan. I'm not sure it was the right way to go. Like humans, uh, and an ending that is just so painfully fucking cold. <laughs> yes, Duncan. We're going to continue the show now, Duncan. Um, I love that fucking oh, movie, though. I it's love so it. good. It's so He is so fucking good as a director. It's like scary how good he is. And people are like, oh, that movie, The Favourite. It won awards and all the rest. And I'm like, yes, but have you seen the movies before? 
like, have you seen The Lobster? Because you really need to watch The Lobster. No, um, and, and, like, this is one of those things where I really, really love Kelly of a Sacred Deer, yeah. and I have not seen everything that Yorgos Lanthimos has directed. You've not seen The Favourite yet, stupid. still haven't you? I still haven't seen The Favourite, I haven't seen The oh, Lobster. Oh, dude, it's so fucking good. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. I know, like, I know, I know. And it, it's just that I'm like, I don't know that I need another killing of a sacred deer in my life where it took well, me not, like three. Not, yeah, it's not like that. I, it's a different sort of weird. I know, but it's like with 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 there, there are certain directors that I'm like this with where I got to kind of watch a movie a couple of times yeah. to warm up to it. And yeah. that's how I feel about Killing of a Sacred Deer, where the first time I watched it, I was like, I don't think I like that movie very much. <laughs> and then by the third time I watched it, I was like. I swear to God, I would sacrifice somebody that I loved to continue to watch this movie. Yeah, on a regular like, that's, I think that's where me and you are like, like we we come in quite a lot on movies, but that's where me and you are like different though. Like with the, uh, I like embrace the weird right off the bat. Yeah. Like the first time I watched that movie, I was like, "This is like a stone cold killing masterpiece." Like just the, like genuine like drop on the floor. But I have many friends who watched it the first time and were like I, I, it's the language it's just the way people talk. it's so off-putting I, I you yeah. know i felt chilled when i would i felt you know not great for a couple of days after it but then they went back to a second time knowing that that's the prerequisite like characters are just not going to speak like normal people speaking in an interaction they're going to have a particular cadence which is off kilter and then like once they watch it the second time though they come back and they're like this is this is so fucking dark and, and great, and I'm it's like, yep. so funny, man. It, like it, it once you realize how how actually funny the movie is. Oh, it's very com- funny, yeah. But I mean, it's just the darkest of comedy. Yeah. But the Colin Farrell. I know I've said this before. And this is a brief preview of the A24 show later. Colin Farrell telling his kid, "I'll shave your head and I'll make you eat your hair." Is that what yeah. you want to eat all your hair? <laughs> fucking slays me. It is so funny. Him threatening, I will literally make, I'm not kidding around here. I will literally make you eat all your hair. I said, no, like, it's I, this so is what I, I love it. You must have, as an actor, it's, it's, a, it's a lynching thing again. You must have a complete confidence and faith yes. in your director to do that. It's like, I told you before, like, um, there's, there's a great, uh, it's on one of the award things and it's Naomi Watts talking about working with David Lynch and she's it, it was it was to do with Twin Peaks have returned and I think it's the scene where she goes in to basically like have a go at the guys that own the casino uh, to do with the, the family debt and all the rest and um, like she she does her thing and um, like she says to tell David Lynch like box out commands using the megaphone like as you do but apparently he was right beside her and he's like you're really angry you're angry you got to get mad like this just like shout that and she's like okay but he'll talk to you while you're performing like so and the bits in between so they must obviously some guys must be incredible to take it as stuff but like when she'll say things if there's a break you'll be like now you're angrier you're like, like, like just in the like constantly in your and the absurd the absurdest stuff that they have to do in his movies and in that tv show in particular you have to have 100 percent confidence that you're doing his vision and he's David Lynch and look at everything he's done. That's going to look fucking great because if you don't, there will be a certain part where you must be like, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, what, why am I dressed like this? What, like, what, why am I speaking to a talking teapot? I mean, like what, what are we doing right now? You know, like and that, I think that's why like he works with the same, he's got that same core group of actors that come back to work with him it's just those ones that just really live in the moment of david lynch's whims or just don't give him shit about it like i just don't want to have to explain myself (laughs) over and over but there there must be a point when you you hear stories of working with certain directors right and then you like appear to work with them you have that experience but then on the back end like to me i would always be thinking just do what he says because this is david lynch and everything i've ever seen him do is incredible so this is just the process the process is different from what it is everywhere else but that's how he gets what he gets out of it so yeah, but there's like i think yorgos is exactly the same that i feel like when i'm watching these movies there must be a point where the actor's like 
why am I doing this? But then, you know, like you see the end result and the end result is chilling. Um, so you have to, it's the process, Bo. It's the process. Yeah. And, and clearly he has that kind of relationship with Colin Farrell at this point where mm. he's just he's like. He's a fucking woefully underrated actor. I keep saying that. 100%, he's such a, yes. Such a great actor. Such a versatile actor. Yeah. Like you look at Killing of a Sacred Deer and then you remember In Bruges. And they are two completely different, like two, like, but at the same time, destructive performances of characters that are wallowing in the, you know, the the afterglow of mistakes they've made, but completely differently performed, uh, you know, like on different scales, you know, one being more m- monotone and clinical to the one being kind of over the top and almost comical. Um, it's, you know, he's, he's, I, I give him all the roles. Yeah. You give him more roles. Yeah, he's right. Call of was amazing. Uh, well, let us shift now, Duncan. Shift Look, people uh, like to bring us questions. And, uh, yeah, and we will say that I do have a question beer to open. Oh. oh I think, a can of answers, Bo. A can of, a can of honesty. <laughs> the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. has <laughs> been pointed out before. Um, <laughs> so, folks, uh, feel free to drop a question into the chat if you have one. I got one lined up from uh, from the Ram Man, Ooh, uh, bring it. and he says, "Let me move my bottle of water to read the question, Duncan." <laughs> it's uh, it's fine, just a small technical problem. Don't worry about it. Uh, he says, "Recently, the director of My Bloody Valentine said he still hopes to do a sequel titled Valentine Wakes. Do you think this could work, or will it just cheapen the open ended mystery of the original?" Is it an open-ended mystery? I uh, I mean, there's a song that's just like, "Hey, it's this dude." Yeah, like I I, I thought it was pretty resolved at the end. I might All- be wrong. Like okay. I, I like sadly, it's one of those movies where the se- the the remake has kind of clouded my mind more than the original. I've seen the original a handful of times. If I'm honest, I don't really rate My Bloody Valentine that high. It's great for the kind of exploitation slasher that it is. But it's always kind of, always to me is the, like when someone says at the start of the movie that they're going on a trip, they're the killer. Uh, <laughs> that's, yeah. the, that's that's the beauty, that's the beauty of Scream. Because when Sydney's dad goes on a trip, as the audience, you're supposed to be led to believe that he's the killer. And they, you know, they subvert your expectations there. But in terms of like my boy, I thought that was well resolved. Yeah, I, I think the larger question, and what what I I think is interesting about this, isn't so much. I mean, should the director of the original My Bloody Valentine be able to make a prequel called Valentine Wakes or whatever? Sure, sure. Like, oh, is it a prequel? Right, right. Mm, even then, then, uh, or you know, whatever, <laughs> uh, or a uh. sequel uh, called Valentine Wakes, I guess. But at any rate, I like the I like the name. But I, I don't. But when you here's... expect to see David Boreans in a movie called Valentine <laughs> Wakes, let's be real. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the movie I want to see. Is the sequel to that one? The sequel to Valentine, please. Um, yeah, like I don't know. Like I imagine there is an inbuilt fandom for it. Uh, to me, one of the better things about that movie is it's not a franchise and there wasn't a sequel. You know what I mean? So it didn't have enough time to have sequels to cheapen it. At the same time, though, everyone should be... Listen, if the guy's got a cool idea and he wants to bring it to the screen, make it. You know what I mean? You you you, you owe it to yourself. It's a competently made movie, but at the same time, I'm like, why not? Like, that's the movie you're famous for, so I get the inclination. It's probably easier for you to make a movie which is a sequel to that movie in terms of getting financing and all the rest, but just tell a different story. Yeah. You know I, I mean? all Right. I, and I, the question to me is, is this just a dude who is kind of older now and is like, hey, you know what would be good for my retirement? Valentine <laughs> Wakes. Well, yeah, like, but there's another part as well is like, um, and I'm seeing like on the chat thing here, someone's put, doesn't he escape at the, at the end of the original? Yeah. I think you're right. I think he does. But where are we setting it? Are we setting it now in 2021? In that case, the killer is now 
what, 40 years older than he was then, and he wasn't no spring chicken then. So we're doing the Halloween thing where we're following around, like, old man mind mask uh, as he goes around. I don't, like, I don't know if... Like, did, did, was there anyone, like, see, see when you build the Mount Rushmore of slasher movies, is my bloody Valentine on that list? Well, all right, counter-argument, Duncan, if it yes. please the court. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I would like to offer exhibit uh, remake slash sequel, The Town That Dreaded Sundown, which is yes. a movie Ooh. nobody wanted, but turned out to be real good. Yep. Yeah, that's a good. It's a good point, but that was made by modern directors who had a interesting take on the on the genre. Like it was the guys basically behind uh, American Horror Story that did that. Yeah, so they've yeah. been playing it in that pool for a while. This is the original guy coming by. This is the original guy that made. Sorry, I don't want to upset people. Relatively derivative slasher movie back in eighty one, wanting to return to make a sequel to said derivative slasher movie in twenty twenty one. So you don't think 40 years later, he's like, Eureka, I've got I've a way to it. reinvent the slasher movie. I've done it again. Right. Oh, you did it again, Marty. <laughs> oh, you know, pat yourself on the back. Yeah. yeah. I just, I always get the feeling that when has this ever worked well? You know what I mean? When, <laughs> it, when, like, when has ever a direct sequel to a movie 40 years ago worked well? well what was the business in uh uh with the guy who did robin hardy the guy who did the wicker man what was that Long, oh no the years oh, later no. the wicker tree the was wicker that? tree is goddamn awful right this is my point um it is up as as, as nigh on in fact if anything put side by side with the wicker man remake the wicker man remake looks like high art <laughs> uh, well come on man how did it get burned bo how did it get burned um that's, that's a question we all have to ask ourselves no it's, it's really 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 but i think there's a there's a like i see there's a unfortunately georgie romero got stuck with this right and it was that it was easier for romero to make another of the dead movie right because he would get financing for that than it would be for him to make any other movie after a certain point they just wait what you're the zombie guy and it's a horrible thing i think like filmmakers have shown to have an aptitude which even then i don't know if i would say the guy <laughs> in my body I, i'm taking pot shots unfair pot shots well, i've not got a movie um but it's, i mean it's okay for what it is you know for a scooby-doo mystery that's literally what it is you know it's the, it's, it's the minor killer you know what i mean that's, that's right from scooby-doo so old man minor um i, I just don't I, I like i don't i'm sure he has like a hundred great ideas of how to continue that on i, I just don't think personally speaking that when that movie finished i was like well it got away hmm can't wait to see what they do next i was just like right got away at the end good for this movie it did something slightly different from the other ones where we usually get a dead killer it, it just never screamed to me it'd be like it'd be like the like the director of curtains in 2021 going Eureka, I've done it again. I've got this idea for curtains to final curtains. Popcorn um, two repopped. You know, like, like it's, it's those ideas where like part of the charm of those movies is they are one and done. So I always go back to the burning. The burning is a standalone movie, it's kind of fucking great. But had there been a burning two, a burning three, a burning four, um, I think. I wouldn't, it wouldn't be as remarkable. The reason that movie kind of stands out as much as it does is because not only Savini's effects in it and the cast that are in it that went on to do bigger and better things is that it could very easily have been another Friday the 13th but just didn't do that. So it got, it got all the elements that you want from that first slasher condensed and in there and it didn't feel the need to continue on. And I think that in itself is something to celebrate. Now this guy wanted to make more movies. If he's got something else to say, let him say it. I just don't think that... I, I just can't remember hearing anyone ever say, I, I can't wait for My Bloody Valentine to. And that to me is usually a good indicator that people are either satisfied or not interested when that movie finishes there you know it, it it does what it needs to do 
Um, uh, yeah, and that was a lot more negative than I intended that to come out, if I'm honest. Yeah, but you're, you went dark on us. That, it's just not a movie that I think is... Like, like I said before, like you you sit me down and say, right, you can, you can green light and finance a new movie. It's either going to be Behind the Mask 2 or fucking, you know, My Bloody Valentine 2. I'm going Behind the Mask. And the fact that we're in 2021 and that does not have a sequel is fucking criminal. And that is a movie that sets itself up for a sequel. Four words, Duncan. Lost after dark two. Yes. What the fuck happened? Well, Where's the lazy ass had... writer of that movie? <laughs> the... You tell me that you had a sequel in the works for me. I, I, we, it, it, like, if we had done better money, we would have done one. I, yes, there is a yeah, sequel. Did that you, is... did you, did you tell them it had mutant babies? I look. I tried to explain. <laughs> How, how cool it would be to have mutant babies that you could <laughs> literally stab with a pitchfork. I just, I just love that. I love the idea, like, like that, the, like, the, this, like the boardroom meeting and you and Ian are on one side and the, you know, the, the producers and all the rest are on the other side. They're like, I mean, we're just looking at the numbers and the numbers, I mean, they're good, but they're just not, what I'm saying is, we might not have a sequel here, and you being like that, that did from the history channel. It's like aliens. <laughs> like, hey. like, I've got hey, oh, I've got one phrase for you: mutant babies. And right. Like, have you thought about mutant babies <laughs> at all? I mean, just consider. Th- and I'm not talking just in cribs. I'm talking on the floor, in the walls, on the ceiling. They're all over the goddamn place. And how <laughs> they're in the walls, god damn it, in the right. walls. Right, like little rats, but they're babies and they've got gross teeth and shit. Uh yeah. how how much fun would that be to shoot and or poke them? Well, all you need to do listen, all this new story is telling me, boys, all you have to do is wait 40 years and then come back and pitch a Lost After Dark 2. Right. Hey, guys, I got it. <laughs> I, I have pro- done it again. I'm right. <laughs> You did it again, Bo. <laughs> um, oh, all right. <laughs> Speaking of great slasher movies. Lost After Dark, check it out. Uh, yes, please. As I've often said, buy three or 4,000 copies. And you too can see Mutant Babies. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's really all I want, people. <laughs> that and my Twin Peaks memes. cult. I want... I want my Lost After Dark sequel, and I want my Twin Peaks cult, and I don't think that's too much to ask. It's not too much to ask, Bo. You know, I've still, I've, I've still got good years left to make those things happen. Um, if everyone that listened to us prattle, <laughs> this mm-hmm. is what I'm going to use, um, you know, spent five dollars or something on buying a copy of that movie, then that's a step towards that sequel. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You don't buy ha- your friend. Every time someone has a birthday in your family, buy them a copy of Lost After Dark. Uh, here's the thing. is uh, It's it's available for rental on some of the streaming services. Uh-huh. Uh, you don't even have to watch it, people. You just rent it and let it play. You know, or don't you do something or else? just well, rent you should it. Actually, you should actually watch it. It's surprisingly fun. I see surprisingly, surprisingly fun. <laughs> the reason I say it's surprisingly fun is the whole time I've known you, the the, the kind of disclaimer that comes with Bo is, I don't like slasher movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, I've written a slasher movie. So I was like that. Oh, this is Bo just going to be like, oh, this is dumb slasher movies. Look at me. I'm a dumb slasher. Like that, but it was actually surprisingly well, <laughs> so thank like, you. I would have thought I'd been written by someone that had been watching and enjoyed slashers all their life. I, it was certainly written by someone who'd watched a lot of slasher movies um, yeah. and was like, hey, if I did, if I did, what, what, what was the slasher movie I would like to watch? Yeah, and, it's, it's kinda, it kind of feels like they should have got you in to write season one of Slasher available on Netflix. <laughs> all right, let's <laughs> let's get into this son of a bitch. Segway, uh, segway, Well, Well played, segway. sir. Uh, so let's get into this. Uh, this is uh, episode five. It is called Ill Gotten Gains, uh, which is separate from Chris Gaines, <laughs> aka uh, Garth Brooks. Oh, uh, Ill Gotten Gains is uh, is kind of where we are <laughs> right now. Five episodes in. <laughs> so, Duncan, we open on. 
what is essentially a Mass and Gill commercial, where two two a, a, a young lesbian couple are walking through young a field with question a dog. mark hey, young ish. question mark, and they're walking through this this field of golden wheat with the dog from summer school. Yep, and you remember me. <laughs> On the fields of hell. It's literally, it's literally Sting singing in the background. Uh-huh. As uh-huh. we cross the years ago. And so the this couple, uh, one of them is taking pictures, and the other one clearly doesn't give a shit about her girlfriend taking pictures or anything. And no, it's she just, just wants like, to squeeze that tit. Right. She's, she's all about those titties. <laughs> she is. She's just like, hey, how about we go home and fuck? And <laughs> she's like, you can take a photo of the birds. I want to see those birdies right now. Yeah, she, <laughs> she uh, apparently is a fan of uh, Duncan and Bo Cup Correct because she's like, hey, I've been listening to this podcast and they've been saying we should be fucking. We should be fucking right and, now. Well, and, forget the dog, forget the pictures. Well, the thing about this is, like, I'll tell you, the, the thing it did right for me right at the start here is it gave me these two characters and I'm like, do I need to remember another two fucking characters that are going to be in this for an episode and we'll reveal their sin and then they're gone. And the show's like, no, 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 don't worry about that. <laughs> Don't, yeah, don't even worry about these characters. They'll be, this is all they're good for. Uh, but so they, they start making out and the dog starts barking. They're like, you know, shut up. We're trying to fuck. And then finally they're like, all right, we got to go see what, what's going on with the dog. And then over- dog is having the best day of its life, by the way. The tail's going, it's nose deep in something it shouldn't be. Yeah, it's a real, you know, just going after or something. And it's a real, it's a real, I have now had the taste of human flesh. I will kill you and your sleep owners. <laughs> oh yeah. You got to put this dog down, Duncan. A hundred percent. Like that's the thing they don't talk about on this show, but uh, absolutely. Because what happens is this dog has come across the body of June, who was the, the lady that got kidnapped at the end of the last episode and given like she woke up in the field with the IV and the honeycomb yeah, on her, on her boobies which, and her like, yeah, which by the state of one decomposition, two insect larvae. I mean, there's there's so much like maggots and all the rest in her. She's missing pretty much I love most it when of her rib body farm. Yeah, like she is like she is she is she has been consumed by the earth. If you've ever watched the music video for Heart by Nine Inch Nails is you know when the the kind of sped up animated uh, Fox decomposition video, which I think is a famous video anyway. I was going to go Peter like, Gabriel's digging in the dirt, but go on. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like that. It's basically like that. The, the, there's far too much insect activity in her, uh, and bits missing from her from the what two rats that we saw who are apparently full and just decided to fuck off. They have not stayed there to continue eating. Um, and you know, like some like that, she like so she's been there for a while. You know what I mean? Because that's the only way that would explain this horrendous condition of her body. And then we literally like some like that, or that's Jin. So Bo said at the end of the last episode, I think they'll find Jin. Bo, they did not find Jin. Well, uh, and you, they you know, do. Frustrate? Well, you know, not alive. No, uh, not and also, alive. what's even more, even what's more even frustrating about this is. They have not, and I'm going to do a spoiler for this entire episode, have not explained what happened to Jin, why she ended up in that position. No, they have not said, like, this is her sin and whatever. Nothing. And I'm going to just go to, I'm going to go on record and I'm going to say, we won't. I think this is going to be a plot <laughs> hole feels... on this fucking show. I think they're just not going to circle around it. They're going to, like, just leave it kind of hanging because that's, this show doesn't look back, but oh, look forward. Only yeah, has. it's a yeah, the, much like uh, is it Rafiki the monkey from The Lion King? <laughs> it's Indy Pest, you know, it's that. It's, um, but like, we are literally like, like, like full steam ahead, and then we transition from there, Bo, to and this is what we were saying, but I think before we hit record, uh, for this show, or maybe you might get a clip of it right at the start. The next scene is like everyone at Cam's house and they're all having something to drink and eating like nibbles and all the rest. Yeah. And logically your brain is like, and I was thinking to myself, finally we're skipping a funeral. Thank fuck. Because you know how funerals happen really quick in the show slasher as in the same day. Uh, I'm glad that they've skipped over this and we're straight to the week. Um, and I'm like, 
few. And I'll tell you the first warning, the warning thing that came up for me was our, our main stay, Sarah, to be sure, to be sure, goes up to speak to the Cam's dad, father, fucking father Red Herring. Um, and she goes up to speak to him. And uh, she's like, like about, and he's like, yeah, about yesterday. And I'm like, yesterday? <laughs> Not yeah. Like, quite, she's like, he said that stuff about me where, like, I, you know, I'm the reason Des come to town and all the rest. It's like, listen, he was emotional because he's too bubbly. That his daughter in law's yeah. dead. He's just like, hey, I used to think that he loved me. It's like total Katrina in the waves in the years. And um, he's just like, and I'm like, yesterday. And I'm like, no, fuck off. And Slash yeah. was like, no, no, no. That's that's what we're giving you because within seconds, Cam is being pulled out by the sheriff, who, by the way, once again has one of the greatest lines in this episode about her being a failed artist, which I'm like, that. Ah, just give this guy a side show. I just want to, I want to watch his spin-off show, like Frasier, but him just like putting down residence. Now that um, Brenda's gone, he's all we got. You know, he's, he's all like, we got. We've got to hold on to him. He's a national fucking treasure. Hold uh, on for, for one more day. <laughs> I love how musical we are today. Uh -huh. um, I, he takes him outside, <laughs> delivers the news to Cam who kills over, and I'm like, oh, they've just found the body, and she was missing less than 24 hours. Yeah. She went missing middle of the day, like the day before in the church. And now, like, that was a morning walk. And she is mostly consumed by animals in the earth. Yeah, I well, mean, I, I, does right, right, like, differently Chief, in Slasher? Chief Brimley, like, pulls him outside and is like, because Sarah is watching all this through the window. Oh, she's so nosy. She's the yeah, nosiest oh, she's, character ever. She's a real she's busy like Jessica Fletcher. Yeah, she is. What? She's a modern Jessica Fletcher. Everyone that she interacts with dies horribly and she's really nosy to find out. Except, unlike Jessica Fletcher, she doesn't solve the mystery. Yet. No, yeah. Look, again, we're going to get to this scene where the chief is just like, all right, God damn it, just stop. Anyway, but, but he is telling Cam, he's like, listen, you know how June was a dog lover? Well, Cam, I, I got good news and I got, I got some goddamn bad news. And... <laughs> And then we immediately cut to the autopsy <sighs> where there's a doctor who is just like, uh, what are you people doing here? Cause it's, it's Cam, his father, the uh, priest. the Reverend. Yeah. Who's, who's not here to give lash rights. Those should have been done a while ago. <laughs> right. The chief, like, and the doctor is just like, uh, look, I guess, do you want me to just, are you going to call anybody else in? Yeah. And they're like, you know, no, oh, is it? God damn it. What now? How does she die? And, uh, he's like, uh, she died of, uh, her uh, chest. It was a paralytic and, and eventually she, she stopped breathing. So she kind of smothered to death mm. and Cam is like, just tell me it was fast. And he's like, he's no, like, uh, no, nope. not at all. It was, it was long and painful. It was uh. probably terrible. <laughs> Because, I mean, she was paralyzed, but she was alive. and uh, Yeah, she was in constant pain. I believe her last words might have been, Cam, save me, please. <laughs> yeah, she had scratched it into the ground. Like, uh, it was, even though she was paralyzed, like one finger. Like, did you ever see that movie, The Burrowers? Kind of like that. Mm -hmm. uh, had one finger that worked, and she uh, uh, carved into the ground, help me, Cam. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and then... Uh, in much smaller letters at the end, you never came, you bastard. This is all your fault. So that's how she went. Also, and, Cam, you might be the killer. Yeah, right. And you, you're probably the murderer. So, uh, uh, <laughs> oh, so good. And and Cam is like, just show me your body. And the doctor's like, look, I. <laughs> Look, I have seen some bodies of my time, but this is particularly gross. <laughs> yeah. And what is seen cannot be unseen. Right. And Cam's like, no, show me her body. And he's like, all right, man. And he and he pulls the the, ba the bag open. And Cam's like, yeah, that's her. And I was like, wait, wait was that the question? Where they yeah. like, we have, I thought we already knew it was her. We knew, we knew it was Jin. Like, yeah, that's definitely her. <laughs> So glad that the last image that you have of your missing wife is you know the maggot infested skull carcass. Um 
Right. Yeah. yeah, we couldn't get all the maggots off, so sorry. Uh, we're you know still washing. And and his father, you know, the Reverend Allen, Reverend, yeah, Reverend Herring. Um, <laughs> Reverend Herring is the best name ever. <laughs> I think that's what we're going with now. So he he kind of hugs his son. He's like, "Come on, son. It's we we got to go." And Kev's just like, "Shut up! Get away from me, you stupid Reverend!" And he w- wants some time alone with the body or something. And everybody's like, well, uh, I mean, it's not customary, but then again, we also invited a county fair's worth of people into this room yeah. to look yeah. at this body, so whatever. Are you sure you would rather have Sarah here with you? Right. I mean, I think our husband's a journalist. <laughs> I like think he could be here as well. Hi, hi, hi. Did I hear me name? <laughs> I'm always available for a good autopsy. <laughs> Whose is it? (laughs) So, if you remember, Duncan, uh, we have a new member of our our, our team, Lisa Ann Fellows, the reporter from the big city. Big deal reporter from the city. So, she is uh, interviewing, essentially, um, Dylan. Or she, or I'm sorry, I apologize. Different scene. She is reporting. Dylan and Robin are watching this report at the bar while she's interviewing Allison and uh, Allison, owner of the paper. You're right. I'm, I'm sorry. Fucking all this up. It's Sarah and Robin watching yeah. on television as Lisa Ann interviews Dylan and Allison. There. Now, why, That's what's like, here's the question. Why would she be? Or, so I'm, I obviously don't watch a lot of American news. Uh-huh. I'm unsure why she would be interviewing two reporters in the studio about a case that was current. You would generally, like in the UK, and this is bringing my, like you would have maybe one reporter there who's, you know, leading on the case can give like, and it's never done in a sort of a salacious sort of way. It's always done in a, a kind of like, right, you know the facts. Uh, what are the police saying about this? Whatever. Like these, like the way she interviews them is if these are criminal investigators working the case. You yeah. Know what I mean, like, yeah. Questions aren't, well, what are the police saying about this just now or whatever? She is deliberately saying to them, well, this wouldn't be in the motives of the killer, as if these two people here are psychologists or whatever it just didn't make sense to me well this whole scene doesn't make sense i know why it's here because it pays off deliciously later on um oh boy does it uh but at the moment i was just kind of watching them going what what would what we're doing here like she's she's asking questions of course dylan's taken all the limelight because it turns out allison is kind of shit when the camera's on yeah completely blows it they're like <laughs> lisa ann fellows throws her a couple of questions out and alice is just like awa 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 and we'd be like obviously this is more of a visual joke here for those that are checking out the video but we're like both saying hey duncan what's your good and your bad and i'm like <laughs> movies <laughs> right things I, they're killer killer come to town and make everyone feel bad but then yeah and finally and, and every time this happens dylan's like i think what allison means to say <laughs> is sorry the to beginning be uh, of time uh there yeah. was nothing but then the god creates you know, it's, it's like she's two seconds away from saying i, I got a poop and then run off screen um it's this, just like you know it's like she's she's so bad at this and i was thinking yeah. Well, I was one thinking, why is she there? She's not the reporter. She's the owner of the paper. And she wasn't actually doing any investigation until this episode, Bo. But she wasn't doing it. So why is she there? And the second thing, like, she is really confident. And she knows what she She's set up all this stuff. I can't imagine this is the first time she's been in front of the cameras. Yeah. It, it's really... Again, the characters behave the way we need them to behave for this story to do what it is. Not the way we want them to behave, just the way we need them to. And, right. And so there's a commercial break or something, and Lisa Ann Fellows is like, hey, Dylan, you're a natural. You're awesome. I might fuck you later. Wink, wink. There's a bit of that in there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, 
And then they cut back to the bar, and Robin is like, boy, he is a natural. And Sarah's like, yeah, yeah, he sure seems to be. <laughs> like, she's all angry about it. Like, why aren't you happy for your husband? I think it's the, I think it's the, like, she obviously knows her husband in one light, and that is this caring, supportive person. And now she's seeing the real Dylan. And the real Dylan is a guy that appears to be, because I think at one point he doubles down on issues specifically to do with Cam that he's just plucking out his ass. You know, like just literally, yeah, I'd like, well, the police say this, but you know, there's this whole other thing going on. And I'm like, well, we're jumping to conclusions here, aren't we? We're making this sensational when it doesn't need to be both. It doesn't need to be sensational. Um, and obviously she's seen it from this point of view of, who is this guy that I'm married to? Um, right. Because it is it's very, very, it's very different from what you would expect from him. But at the same time, we're like, come on, he's been he's been kind of going that way for a while. <laughs> Not the biggest teal turn in the history of online news. You know, he's like, he didn't want to go with you and you wanted to leave because he wanted to stay and finish his two weeks notice. Yeah. Uh, he seems to be doing kind of fine since your grandmother died. He seems to be coping quite well with all this death and mystery in town. You know what I mean? It's, there's just, like, you clearly don't know who you've married, and you're now starting to see it, and guess what? You kind of don't like it, and that is interesting, Mo. Yeah, so she hmm. decides she's going to go get some air. Robin goes with her, and then we cut from them to uh tom winston the town serial killer uh, who is who's meeting with reverend herring yeah <laughs> and there's there's a great bit where of uh, as soon as they sit down tom winston is like so reverend herring do you have do you have my envelope and he's like uh well yeah nice to see you too tom winston yeah and it's Mr. like wait a second man. are you really gonna bitch about the 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 formal politeness of the town serial killer yeah are you like, guys well, that they, but he leans into the you know like he's saying like oh, uh, yeah i don't know how you doing or anything like that. i just buried my daughter-in-law and i'm like but we buried her <laughs> <laughs> well, oh yeah, yeah of course they have because this is Waterbury right. and that's what we do here um like everyone goes in the ground fast and she no she's vegetation. already been buried the tombstone got stolen they had to replace it but the insurance covered it it was fine all that happened in the space of about 36 hours it's so like <laughs> yeah. it's so fast i, I like i love how like shitty he is because it's like obviously he knows that fact now and he's just like oh yeah how you doing hope you're doing well do you have the fucking envelope and he's like oh here so he hands the but he hands the level in the envelope over at him as if you know like you know this won't give you the peace that you need or the answers that you want. And I'm like, it clearly will, one, give him the answers that he wants, and two, give him the piece he wants, because he wants to find out if or not he is Sarah's Fazia. Yeah, well, and, and this is where I think the show is subverting my expectation. Yeah, I, I don't think he's going to be either now. Right, because... but. The, Here's the fucked up thing, though, Duncan, is that we're having a, this conversation about how Tom Winston is not really her father based yep. on this his reaction to opening this envelope and being like, gods, take me back to my cell immediately. I can't stand to look at Reverend Harry anymore. <laughs> and, but that's all based on a presumption we made about this character and his motivations and then his reaction to a thing that we still don't know. And I'm like, man, we are five episodes into this, yeah. and I'm on a roller coaster of, is he the father? Is he not the father? And this not is the once... soap opera stuff that I'm talking about, yeah. though. But it's no one's ever soap opera games. <laughs> but somebody should be like, somebody should put a point, a, a finer point on it. Like the Reverend at that point should be, should say, that's right, she's not your daughter, and let's have this out in the open and be done with it instead of stringing us along. For two more episodes for a story we are already ahead yeah. of. Yeah, it's it's very like I say, it's all that kind of and I have the answer now when I will take it to myself. Yeah. And I'm like, really? Come on, let's just get this fucking out of the way or pay it off in this episode. And it's like, no, you shan't know. And I will keep this for at least another two episodes because I'm not gonna tell you in episode six. There's no 
although in saying that, the, there is a setup at the end of this episode that might lead to a confront. Well, will lead to a confrontation, whether that's in episode six or seven, that's left to be seen. But it's all very. We'll give you enough in this because that's the only time he's in this episode, uh, with a a shoddy porno of him back in the 80s. Uh, that's the only time he's here in this entire episode is just to receive this envelope. And that's you, say, you say shoddy, Duncan. I say that that transfer is one of the best VHS to DVD transfers. From the 80s, yeah. yes. Like, yeah. a little, as someone who unashamedly will say that in 1996, when I <laughs> oh dear, uh, when I was, uh, what would I have been, 15, um, I bought from a friend a, a copied copy of a porno on VHS, which was made in the nineties. There ain't no way it looks that good. Ming's already looked like it'd been fucking worn out by the time I got it. It's like, can I see a tit there? <laughs> or is that just the tracking? Um, <laughs> yeah. So this 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 is immaculate. This is like this is the biggest like. Bang Bros have shown up with the full team to fucking shoot this skit back then uh, on digital, which didn't exist at that point, just so we can have this transfer. It is like you can count the chest hairs on Tom's chest. That's awesome. That's how clear this is fucking 4K UHD. Um, comes with special features, a bonus serial killer commentary over the top of it. I think I might be Sarah's father, but we won't know until episode six or seven. Um, <laughs> I like that, right? Like when she fires up the DVD with or without commentary. Like, whoa, well. And there I was entering, told, yeah. <laughs> entering your mother, Santa. I assume it's you watching the, these DVDs. <laughs> she asked me if I was wearing a rubber. I said yes, but I was not. She couldn't seem to tell, but I could. I poked a hole in it, Sarah. I did it because I wanted to put a ring on it. <laughs> As I call was it the, the human. The I call it the human sprinkler. Because when you go it goes. Oh no! You know what I mean? No, is that bad? Is that too far? Uh, it's like putting your thumb over the end of a hose, Santa. You poke a small hole. It makes the stream stronger. I never cross the streams, and I never cross the streams. Uh, this is just good condom etiquette. You could <laughs> read my book, Sarah. Condom etiquette. Condom by etiquette. Tom the serial killer. <laughs> Who knows better than a serial killer in, in prison than the ins and outs of the, the vagaries of the condom business, Sarah? Are you going out for a night on the town? Wear your sleek black condom number. <laughs> the executioner's outfit. <laughs> right. <laughs> going to murder someone <laughs> going to murder someone who has who has been sinning against God try a slimming blue condom <laughs> have you all... ever seen a condom have you ever seen a condom in the dark kind of looks black <laughs> have you ever, you ever danced with a condom in the pale moonlight Sarah <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what I'm going to call sex from now on boy. <laughs> And see with a condom in the pale moonlight. <laughs> oh, man. This, this scene is just, it's pointless. It's, it's purely there to remind you that you probably have a theory on this and we are slowly escalating it. Um, weird that we can find a body, bury a body in 24 hours, yet we can't get like a paternity test result, which feels like it should be quicker. Um, <laughs> And, you know, in that time period, it's been a couple of days since this was handed over, uh, or a couple of episodes, but we're, we're, tying, we're, we're essentially just reminding you this is a thing that we're going to be dealing with, but don't expect any answers anytime soon. All right, but speaking of something that will pay off, we go from that to Allison uh, back at the interview. They're still on their little break. Allison is like, like sweating bullets and shit. <laughs> And I thought she had been poisoned. I was like, yeah, I was like, the executioner has has killed her with poison, and she is about to drop dead on screen. The way that she's sweating and just like, oh, oh she's having like oh, a, a pang oh. of moral consciousness, you know, like where this is like she's sitting there going, are we doing the right thing here? Like a morality issue? No, these are things that Slasher will not give us both because it's doubling down. Right. She so. Allison gets real pissy with the makeup girl. The, the best thing that happens in this scene 
is is like Lisa Ann being like, Dylan, you're a natural. You keep it up. Allison, you know, you're a buckaroo. You <laughs> you just uh, do your best, huh? Try to <laughs> try to keep up, I guess. And Allison is like, as she's give, be given makeup, she's just like, try to get rid of some of this moisture. It's your job. <laughs> You're like, oh, Allison, you're the living worst. <laughs> uh, so Sarah and Robin, who are continuing to drink and just pitch possible serial killers. Which is all they do, to be yeah. honest with you, Bo, that is, like, I think if you lived in Scotland or I lived in, in, in Tennessee, I think this is how we would spend one yeah. evening a weekend. Uh, you're like oh, every weekend we would just like me and you would convene at some bar somewhere and we would just have cold case files in front of us and we would just try and solve it through bourbon <laughs> yes. so they are Bo, you're right Bo, Bo, Bo Ransdell and Duncan McLeish sponsored by Maker's Mark DBCC cold cases Right, the the awesome. same level of detective that you get out of oh, under a, uh, under the Silver Lake of just it's like is literally is the because they're like it could be this guy and I'm like looking at it like what's your what's your evidence here? Well, remember how he he, he looked at this point? He wasn't there at that bit. And I'm like, well, this is why you're not a police officer and you should yeah. stop giving shit to the main guy uh, and Cam and all the rest and that they have actual evidence. Right, you just randomly pick someone to accuse until until proven different. That is. The Do they have guess who in the states? The board game, you know, the thing. Where yeah. You're like a, yeah. Well, that's literally what they have done. Yeah. It's like the worst game of Clue ever. It's, it's just like. Yeah, it, they call it Cluedo. That's how shitty a game of Clue it is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like um, it's Father Harrington with the kill kit and the library. Uh, so, literally right. this is the label that we're dealing with here and and speaking of so here is exactly how all that shakes out so they're like Re reverend herring is our guy mm -hmm. and sarah's like are you sure <laughs> and and rob is like well prove me wrong which is not what you do <laughs> yeah and so she's That's like it's the other way around you get evidence first that yeah. leads you in the direction of something and then you use that evidence to prove your theory you don't work backwards you don't randomly pick someone that's bad <laughs> and and so sarah says you're full of shite they, they went through his house there's no way he could be the killer <laughs> and and he's like Aha, they went through one of his houses, but what about his other house? She's like, what are you talking about then? And then they go to the church. And as soon as they God, get there. Oh, the house of God. It was quite clever how they did that. Yeah. and But as soon as they get there, immediately Robin goes from, we need to be searching this place to, we're probably not going to find anything. Yeah, I'm like, you're fucking useless. Right, and so Sarah is, snoops around, finds in uh, like a wardrobe in the office this black bag. Mm -hmm. And inside the black bag is a rope and a hammer and nails. Big old nails. Yeah, big iron Biblically spike large nails. large yeah. size nails. Like nails that you don't buy now. Like, right. You can't go to a hardware store and say, I'll have the Jesus cross nails, please. You know, the yes. ones that I'll have the stigmata nail, please. <laughs> you just don't fucking get that. But they're here. Stigmata brand nails. <laughs> um, for when you want something to stick. Right. Like, you know. <laughs> the, like, the only thing you use these nails for is uh, crucifixions and hammering edicts to things. <laughs> you know? Like if you were gonna let like uh, Martin Luther use this for the the ninety five theses or whatever, I love um, the back. I love the idea that on the back the two examples he gave you is one someone being crucified and another one an old fashioned pim crier putting up a fucking sign. <laughs> hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> um, but as soon as they open this bag, Sarah's like, "That's it. He's the killer." Yeah, it's just, she she refers to this later on as a kill kit, which yeah. one me wonder how she knows what a kill kit to, looks like, and two, how she got to the conclusion that a hammer, a rope, and some nails equals kill kit. Right, uh, look, it's biblical. This is this is easily gonna be the murder kit of the next victim. So fucking dumb. It, it, so, so cut to the next morning. 
Cam is sleeping in. And, <laughs> and Sarah texts him and is like, hey, Cam, it's a darn if I come over. I know I know you're dealing with the death of your wife and all. But yeah, how no, about I come over? Was yesterday. Right. <laughs> and, defend the body. and Cam is just like he looks like he's been drinking and he's not taking any of this real well. Mm. And then he he looks at his phone and then immediately like there's a knock on the door and she's yeah. like it's me i'm outside <laughs> <laughs> like it's the most asshole move of like texting someone that but this hey. is, but it's not the most asshole move the most asshole move is about to happen over coffee <laughs> yes yeah, so right she he cam is just like yeah i guess you can come in have have a seat i'll make you some coffee which just goes to show this show really is canadian yeah. Um, you and then, coffee, right? And she's like, "Boy, this is a real fun cup of coffee you made here, Cam." Say, do you think this your is father the tact, could? This is the tact of the show. I, I like. I, I would love to like say that we're we're doing it for comedic effect, yeah. but we really are not. She, the coffee has just been poured. He has just sat down, and she literally says to him, "Hey, have you maybe?" thought that your dad's the killer yeah and and i was like oh my fucking god no right no. Just, i know your dad knows tom winston do you think it's possible that he's orchestrating the killings from inside his jail cell maybe with the help of your reverend and cam is like the fuck what but maybe what has, you're the killer <laughs> How about get, that, Sarah? <laughs> we get serial killer top trumps here. It's yeah. like accusation doctors is like, well, maybe it's you, or maybe it's your husband. Like, maybe it's Dylan. And I'm like, oh, we're just like throwing everything now. And the two of them like, uh. <laughs> really, like she, yeah, uh. she gives a like, there's no way it's him. And he's like, Oh, really? Really? Your husband couldn't be the killer? Where's he where's he been on the nights that people have been murdered? And she's like, Well, I don't know, but let's get back <laughs> to your father. <laughs> your, your father, the priest. And and she says, I am convinced that your father is hiding something. And Cam is like, Yeah, so's your husband. How about you get the fuck out of my house and leave the coffee? Yeah. And so she takes off. Uh, That's how you know you've offended a Canadian when they tell you to leave with unfinished coffee. Hey, how about you get out of here and you leave the coffee and the Tim Hortons, all right? <laughs> no, but, we love yeah. you, Canada. Put down the double-double and you get the hell out of here. How about that, eh? <laughs> Sick and tired of you stepping all over my good manners and welcoming nature. Um. <laughs> anyway, so Dylan then shows up at the, the newspaper office with coffee for everybody speaking of. Yeah, he's cock of the walk. He's like, listen, I'm Mr. TV personality. I'm the guy that everyone knows and loves i am dylan and if anyone can dylan can and as soon as he shows up allison's like yeah thanks for showing up i guess i mean <laughs> we've all been here at work for a little while i guess the star of the show just shows up whenever he wants and he's like yeah look uh sorry about that i didn't mean a upstage or anything i just hey maybe i took some acting lessons i could give you some acting lessons too yeah i could give you some pointers which she does not take well <laughs> right which, to be honest it's like because she says it herself, she's like i know i bombed and it's like yeah i could give you some pointers and i'm like wrong time to do that with your boss right hey yeah how about you don't be a dick about this and, yeah and uh and we just learned, and I don't even know if Dylan's clear that this is his boss, but we just oh, learned yeah, the we last only, yeah, episode. To, to be fair, we only found out in the last episode, so maybe he isn't quite sure what the hierarchy at work is yet. Um, and she's like, shut up, I'm hacking into June's text. Well, this is this is the thing, right? So, like, like she's like, I've been busy here working on leads, and he's like, do you have something? And she's like, well, you know, I can't. He's like, do you? I'm your editor-in-chief. Um, like, I, do you have something? And she shows him her trying to hack into June's phone records. And Dylan all of a sudden is like, listen, this is unethical. Not only is it unethical, it's illegal. If we do this, you know, we shouldn't do this. And she's like, but think of all the juicy texts that we'll get between, you know, forbidden lovers and all the rest. And imagine what Lisa, what's her face? Lisa Ann know, Fellows. 
Lisa Ann Fell is like, imagine what she'll be like if she has it on the front page and all the rest. And you can see that this moral quandary, this ethical dilemma is played over for as much time as it takes to cremate a body and bury it in, uh, <laughs> in the TV show Slasher because next thing we know, Bo, we are going to be getting it on the fucking... <laughs> How does time work in this show? Next thing we know, it's already in print. <laughs> yeah, it's already in print. It's being reported on. The next time you hear anything about this, it's already on the front page of the paper. So she's hacked it. She got the co- she got the pin code to hack it. She they wrote the story. Through, she but but she she must have read the entire chat thread, yep. picked out the bits that she need, constructed a story around it, and published it. In less than twenty four hours. That's all. That's all. Hundred percent accurate. This is this is how good they are, Bo. This yeah. is how good they are. And so, <laughs> while that's happening for Dylan, <sighs> Sarah is at work at her gallery, and Reverend Herring pops by. Yeah, well, this is the gallery where everyone that comes in to buy, you know, like a painting or look at the paintings, will threaten Sarah. Like anyone that comes in, like that old couple that are left in there right at the end of this scene, I imagine walk over and start maliciously interrogating her and using horrible sexual rape innuendo directly to her face because that is how every customer in this shop has behaved to poor little Sarah, to be, I, too, to be sure, to be sure. I love the fact that the Reverend starts off kind of like passive aggressive friendly with her. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, he's like, let me tell you a story, Sarah. A uh, uh, woman goes into a, a priest for confession, and she <laughs> says, uh, "I've been been spreading false rumors about uh, about my friends." And the priest tells her to take some chicken feathers and take them to all these corners of the town. And then she comes back, and, and the priest says, "Good, good. You, you you scattered all those feathers around. Now go get them. I want you to go get them back." And she says, "But Reverend." I can't because the wind has scattered them. Just like your word, Sarah. <laughs> like he turns on a dime and gets in her face about it. It's wonderful. He's he's slowly working up there. Like even his last scene in this episode here is slowly working the reverend into my heart. Yeah, and he's because he he could be he could take up the mantle after what looks like is going to happen in the next episode as my favorite character. Um, I could, I still next, Chief Brimley is still the character that. I'm like, yeah, but I like if you know what I mean. What I'm saying, I yeah. don't think Chief Brimley is long for this world, though. Who I think the priest will be beyond this, and he's the one that they're going to have to like in a really race. Uh, we've had the grandmother who passed the baton off to Chief Brimley, who's I think going to have to pass the baton off to the father, who is kind of all sorts of awesome right now. Yes, uh, but yes, you're yes, right. yes. He's like <laughs> right in our face with it as well. And then there's like, this old couple come in, and he's just like, "You think about it." <laughs> well, yeah, like, on his way out, the, what he says is, "Your parents were naive, Sarah, and they thought they were invincible. You shouldn't make the same mistake." Oh, bo harsh. Yeah. And so later, Sarah's just walking the streets uh, by herself uh, during all this. Wallowing in contemplation, Bo. Right. <laughs> and and as we mentioned, she looks down and there is the newspaper that's like, hey, guess what? There are all these texts that June sent to Trent, who both of these people are now dead. But here's these salacious uh, texts they sent back and forth. Mm-hmm. And cut to the newspaper where Lisa Ann Fellows is there reading these texts she is practically orgasmic reading these oh she is having such a good time like she's giggling with them and mm-hmm. like oh they look like oh they they sound like high school kids in love yeah and she's touching <laughs> dylan's arm and you know yeah. being a little affectionate with him and to his slight credit here dylan <laughs> actually stands up and went because at a certain point lisa and fellows is like dylan we need to take you to new york and and have you on the show and stuff and he's like, no, Allison needs to be there too. She's, I know, right, right, yeah, right, you know, yeah. she's my partner in all this. And Lisa Ann Fellows is like, well, <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess maybe. Yeah, and I she's mean, like, I'll tell you what, we'll talk about it tonight. We got a lot to talk about. And, and <laughs> she can be on the radio show. How about that? <laughs> I'll tell you what, we'll have a meeting and then we'll text her after and let her know how it all went. 
Mm-hmm. And so Lee Sanfellows takes off and passes Sarah on the way in. And she's just like, oh, I read the newspaper. Did you ever, <laughs> did you ever consider Cam's feelings for one second, you filthy Canadians? And I love the fact that he turns this and is like, listen, I just report that news. You know I just report the news. I don't make this personal. Yeah. It's in the public sphere. I just, I, I, I report the news. Yeah. I'm, and I'm well, like, mm, is it the news though? Is it the news though? Mm. You know how things move fast. I mean, I've still got to be here for two weeks or yeah. maybe <laughs> three days yeah. or maybe 10 well, days. Who knows? Yeah. Got, what, what year is it? Um, it's like literally like he's handy because we've never at any point heard that he's, that he's noticed he's been retracted. What's her plans in this time now? She must be still working at the guy. I don't know. And the show doesn't care. Yeah, we complete as soon as Brenda died, it was like we're not even bothering with Yeah, we're not moving now. Why why is Sarah not in the midst of like I'm dealing with my mom's house and what we're like why why doesn't she go live there for a little while? Mm-hmm. Anyway, there I again, we should not try to apply logic to this show. Uh it will make us fools in trying to do that. But it's so yes. difficult though, boy. So that my brain just wants it to fit nicely. You just wish whoever had been writing this show had <sighs> thought like, hey, I wonder how Sarah would be behaving and what actually happens mm-hmm. after someone that you love dies. And and not just like the friends and the people in town, but her, her grandmother. You yeah, know, anyone, like you know, anyone really close to her. <laughs> Direct um, family we're members. Gonna get, and, we're going to get so much better from her later on where she uh, goes on a tear. <laughs> so anyway, so night falls on Waterbury, Duncan. Again. And, <laughs> right. And so Cam is watching the uh, and drinking hard while Lisa Ann Fellows is interviewing Allison and Dylan again. Mm-hmm. And we cut. It, it's kind of this montage of seeing this interview while we see Ch- uh, Chief Brimley watching it. The mayor and Sarah are both watching this interview separately. Mm -hmm. And as they're having this conversation, the uh, Lisa Ann Fellows says, you know, if only we could ask the executioner what his motives were. And then Allison is like, hey, I've got an idea. (laughs) She says, well, how about we ask him? And they're like, what? What the fuck? Yeah, like, this is the bit that you're adding to the conversation, Miss Blank Stare. Yeah. And she says, no, I'm serious. Like, if the executioner wants to tell us what is really going on, contact me directly. Me, Allison, owner and or reporter at the paper. And you can you can get in touch with me and I'll have a one-on-one interview with you. And they take a break. Uh, and Dylan is like, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> what is going on? And, and even Lisa and fellows is like, that's, that's a bold move. Ballsy. Yeah. yeah. Ballsy. And, and I love how she's just like that. You're just like to write to Dylan as well. So like, you're just upset. Cause you didn't think about it first. And I'm like, Oh, we've got a good old fashioned power play ball. We do indeed. And to capitalize on this, Allison just walks a home alone at night. Well, this is the bit that fucking blew my mind because they're literally like, you know, he's, he is still out there killing people. So yeah. she just decides to walk alone at night to her car. Right. It's like going to the zoo with like pork chops a- but, but attached to like, you. Like, I want to go in the gorilla cage. Also, like, like she's clearly in a studio recording this, yet she's walking down a residential street to her car. Right. She parked four blocks away. Oh, it's just like this stuff irritates the fuck out of me. I know. Oh. I know. It's nonsense. But uh, she's she's walking alone because she has this death wish, and this voice <laughs> is just like Allison. <laughs> this hey, is a to the- it's the executioner, Allison. The- <laughs> I've left you a note on the front of your car. Don't don't throw it away like it's a ticket. It's it's a note from the executioner. Remember, you, you mentioned me in your interview. This is a, a long sentence for Duncan to be doing to get over his point over how ridiculous this whisper is coming from a bush while you walk towards your car, which was apparently quite far away from where the studio is. But I'm just saying, don't bend the paper. R- promise me you read the... Pro- I, you're still walking away from me. Promise me. Promise me. 
Yeah, and so she gets to her car, and then is like, oh, oh my God, there's an envelope on the window. She gets in the car, closes the door. She could drive away because the envelope's there because a voice has been chasing her. But no, she gets back out the car, takes the envelope off, and then doesn't rush back in the car to read it, locking the doors to be safe, Bo. No, no, no. She reads it on the street. Yeah, and the, the whole note is old foundry. 11 a.m. tomorrow. Love the executioner. And like <laughs> Jeff is scratched XO. out. It's like <laughs> Cam. Cam's right near Cam, yeah. yeah. Um he's, he's wrote, he wrote Cam and one sort of thing and he's put era required. Camera required. <laughs> Hopefully she doesn't piece that together. All of it, yeah. All of it's written out. The, like cam, the cams in those letters that you get from, like, <laughs> magazines, like Ransom Notes, and then the rest is handwritten because he ran out of letters. Um, just, just a quick note from Chad. Andrew saying, she walked home alone at night. What is she, a vampire? Yeah. Huh? Oh, I oh. <laughs> Love it. A radium vampire humor. And mm-hmm. then we get to the best scene of the episode. Which is Sarah showing up to ask Chief Brimley for copies of all the tapes that she turned over as evidence. Yeah, all the tapes of her mum being drilled by everyone that lived locally. Um, she wants it. And, and Chief Brimley, guess what he's going to say, Bo? He's going to say no, because they are evidence. And as we explained in a previous episode, when something is handed to the police and they deem it as being evidence, it's not yours anymore. Yeah. Yeah, and and she's like, I gave that to you in good faith. I expected any time I could come want to see my, my mom fucking strangers. <laughs> you weren't going to stand in my way, you son of a bitch. And he's oh, like, Grimley is so good here. So good. Was, Listen, God damn it. You are not Nancy Drew. And she, she says, well, you're not the boss of this town. And then he's like, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get real with you for a second, God damn it. <laughs> Here's what you are. You are some lady who came back to town because you failed at being an artist, opened up some gallery don't nobody want to go to. You're kind of a piece of shit, Sarah. You, 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 you can't sell other people's art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he does. He gets, like, it is... Tony Collette hereditary level of like yep. sitting there with that stupid face on your face. Yeah. Like it is raw. <laughs> Don't you ever fucking swear at me. I am your, ma- I'm your <laughs> sheriff. Oh man. Every scene was, in every movie should be that dinner scene. It is so oh, I watched it last night and it's just fucking incredible. It's, but yeah, like he, he goes full scale raw. And what I love about the sheriff is he knows when he's won. He knows like right, I might not have solved this case, but I told you a new one. Cause he always gets that kind of wry smile of what no come back? No come back for the sheriff's yeah. coming. <laughs> like, what we're gonna say, Sarah? Oh, you're gonna cry. You're gonna cry right now. <laughs> you gonna cry, little baby? You, uh, hey, I bet you you want tissue. God damn it! Oh. He grabs her, grabs her hands, and starts going. Quit hitting yourself. Quit hitting yourself. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Sarah, I, look, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I got uh, a little bit of a medical exam. I want to give you. Uh, it turns out you might have brain cancer <laughs> if your hand is bigger than your face. So just uh, put your hand up there and swat. Ah, oh, we fell for it. God damn it, sir. You were, you were stupid and a failure. He, like You're... when he finishes this conversation, he gives her antiseptic to deal with the burn wounds. He's just given up. Yeah. Hey, I got a pad right here. I want you to take this down to the Rexall. Get yourself some burn ointment. <laughs> God damn it. Cause you got yourself a chief Brimley burn and that, that oh. takes a while to heal. Um, oh, so good. So, it's, so it's wonderful. good. So then <laughs> she, we cut to Allison, who was having her interview with, uh, like she sets up in the old foundry with like <sighs> a camera and a couple of chairs. And all she's got on her is a taser in her purse. Yeah, which is going to stop the executioner if he want, you know, to, to bring biblical judgment to her. Right. But she's innocent, but she's not done anything like hacking to messages. 
Dude, it turns out that she has done so much worse than that as well. Oh, we... God, yeah. When we get the reveal on this one, I'm like, how have you, like, how do you live with yourself? Like, why was, like, yeah. even, like, the, the talk of a moral quandary of hacking? But then I, I suppose it's it's trying to insinuate when she does that she's just comfortable doing this sort of shit because that's where her brain went to straight away. It wasn't, like, exhaust all the solutions and then hack June's messy thing. This is something that she'd done before. Uh, we just didn't know it at the time. But the executioner comes in, and oh my god. Yeah, well, at first, she's like, hey, you know, how do I know it's you? And he's like, well... Well, he's voiced by Bane, for a start. <laughs> he's voiced... He's Tom Hardy in, like, the Bat Rises again, or whatever it is. <laughs> the Dark Knight Rises? Or... Yeah, oh, I swear to God, that's what his voice sounded like. He's well, too... Well, listen. <laughs> You'll find that the... The paralytic is called Karate. The thing is, he's 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 rocking a very ye oldie timed accent through this. Like his his word use and all the rest. It's not how someone young would speak. Yeah, you know I mean, right. which I suppose is the point. Um, but also it's the clear obvious we're trying to throw you, the viewer, off the scent. But he is like kind of you know like if you track this, if you track this, you will find out that no one knows I have used this compound. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. What are we fucking doing. Wait, she's uh, like, you're a murderer, and he's like, no, I have no reaction <laughs> to sin, not <laughs> sin itself. And <laughs> and then she says. Uh, like you said, uh, she's like, no, 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 I've I've never done anything wrong. He's like. Are you sure? Yeah. You've never done anything with your newspaper. Facts. And only the facts are... Uh, yeah. sorry, <laughs> Alison, that's Allison. what you do. I'm sorry. I, 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 uh, <laughs> I'm a little obsessed with Sarah. You'll have to forgive me. Yes. Then so I will give you like... permission to report. <laughs> Yeah. Every now and again, every now and again, Cam will make... A, I mean, the executioner will make a mistake. I did not say Cam. Who is this Cam? He sounds delightfully handsome and rugged. Is he a football player, Alison? <laughs> rugged, handsome, fine Canadian beef. So yeah, sometimes was let it go, but not today. <laughs> is there something you would like to confess, Alison? Anything Allison. before we leave this interview? And Allison's like, no, uh, uh, I'm squeaky clean. Ain't no flies on this shit, bitch. Yeah. Right. <laughs> she has a moment where she's like, well, uh, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. I did the personal inventory. And no, I, you know, I feel like I've made peace with everything. Yeah. My moral compass always points true North Pole. Right. North. So off the executioner fox. Yes, because for no reason at all, really, this scene is taking place, except for later on where we find out that maybe Allison told the fib or two. Oh, yes. So he looks, uh, Lee Sandfellows checks the footage with Allison and Dylan. And as, she couldn't be any more moist, Paul. Uh, she, <laughs> well, because it's, it's, it's him describing like, Oh, you want to know how I killed Vera McBride? <laughs> well, I took off all her limbs. And yeah. Lisa Ann Fellows is like, oh, I want to build this special around all this footage. Listen, Allison, we're going to put you on a plane tomorrow. And Dylan's like, uh, should we go to the police? And they're like, yeah, 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 whatever. They can watch yeah, us yeah, on but TV. Dylan, but Dylan's also like, you know, D D I need to come along. And she's like, well, ah, ah. we'll maybe phone you in from here. Yeah, I mean, need is a strong word. How about how about we call you? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a real like he is immediately replaced. He's less. Yeah, he's yesterday's news. Yeah. Oh, ho -ho. ironically, see what I did. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> and so then we have the Adult Swim scene. Uh, Sarah goes to the mayor, where <sighs> she shows up, and he's like. Oh, Sarah, hey, we haven't had any scenes together. It's good to finally meet you on this show. And she's like, yeah, yeah, good to meet you too. Listen, I got a favor to ask. <laughs> yeah, I've never asked you for anything, but let me now ask you. Yeah, and and she asked for, you know, listen, I, here's what's going to happen. You're going to lean on the chief of the police, and he's going to give me copies, all them tapes of me motherfucking all them men. 
you uh, can't you cannot say in an Irish accent, here's what's going to happen without the follow-up words being you're going to be taken. <laughs> here's so here's what's going to happen, Mayor. You're about to be taken. <laughs> <laughs> and he's immediately like, "I look, I don't, I can't do that. That's it. Uh, that's unethical." Like, like, who, who are you? Me? I'm not doing that. And she's like, "Oh, really?" And then she's like, "Huh? Listen, I happen to know for a fact you and my grandma used to bump Oakleys." So, what a fact. She's got no evidence out with right. her drunk grandmother said that they did. Right, other than Brenda was just like, the man, yeah, I fucked him. <laughs> um, that's all. All that's admissible in court. And on her way out, she's like, I'm going to get to those tapes. Aren't I, Grandpa? I know. What a fucking, honestly. Remember when she hinted at it? Yeah. Like three episodes ago or something, and now she's just calling him it. Yeah, right. And so he's just like, oh, oh, oh what? Oh, oh. And she oh, leaves. Oh, oh. And so cut to yet another bar, because we only have like three sets in this show. Mm-hmm. And one of them is this bar where instead of uh, Robin and Sarah drinking, now it's Allison and Dylan and Lisa Ann. And... Well, initially it's just Dylan and Allison, and then Lisa. Yeah, Allison's Ann. like she's she's like you can have whatever you want. This is on me, except the champagne. We're not yeah. having the champagne, but you can. These drinks are on me because I'm woohoo, I'm a star. And Dylan's reluctantly like, oh yeah, whatever. And then Lisa Ann just comes in here, and she is oh, she is all about what we are going to do. But she has some sage advice because Allison is a bit concerned. She wants to take things. To the next, interestingly enough, she's having the conversation with Lisa and uh, Lisa and had with specifically with Dylan about listen, this is finite, you know, this story is going to move on, you need to be positioning yourself. And Allison just basically asks, How do I take this to the next level? Listen, there's eight many sins left, and then what happens? And you know, Lisa's going to give her some sage words of advice. She and, says, Become yeah. wrath, detective. <laughs> Allison, <laughs> Allison, I wanted to I, I wanted to see if I could be a reporter, Allison. Dylan's in the corner going, Lisa Ann's got the upper hand. <laughs> yeah, Dylan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lisa Ann Fellow says the upper hand. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the gun, Allison. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, she basically tells her she's too clean she's too she's like that. Yeah. You, you don't have that killer instinct to survive you're too squeaky clean and what i thought we were going to get was a confession of this you know you know that story that we got about Jim, right the, the hacking that hacking. you just saw yeah 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 like because she's been squeaky clean up to that she had to cross that moral line for that purpose she was pushed to do it but Turns out, no. Turns out, like you see, it's infinitely fucking worse. Yeah. Like, of all the crimes that have happened in this show, this is the worst one. By by a million miles. Like this. And the is payment the... that we get yeah. is the is the slightest. <laughs> like she did not suffer. Um, <laughs> like nearly enough compared to the guy who drove the ambulance past the drunk girl who was bitten alive by fucking snakes. Right. Like, oh. It, oh. So. What Allison confesses here is that way back at uh, we've talked about this a number of times in the course of the show is there yeah. there was a girl named Ariel Peterson who was kidnapped uh, that you were referencing like the EMT driver uh, Trent yes. in June uh, yeah. come by and and she was Which like by I'm the way, only 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 occurred to me in the interim. Like, we were talking about how Trent, like, fell into that hole, and, yeah, it looked like he broke his leg, but he essentially became rendered useless. You remember what Trent worked as? Uh, he was a, he was a paramedic. Yeah. So how did he just set his leg? Like, all the medical training, but it's just another thing that Slasher doesn't want you to get hung up on that. When it, like, when I thought about that, I was like, oh, no, fuck you, Slasher. Yeah, but it was more like, fuck you. It was a bit like that, actually. Uh, but yeah, so like, she's like, listen, listen, listen. Let me, let me bear. <laughs> I've had a few, 
I had a few G's and T's, right? And let me let me bear the worst Rolling fucking down the thing. Street. That's the worst thing I have ever done. Nay, the worst thing that this town has ever happened since the murders by the executioner first time round. <laughs> let me ump the ante in confessions here. And yeah, Ariel went missing uh, because we assume, like, well, because we have been conditioned to believe because Trent and maybe June drove past and left on a drunken state and a car picked her up and we don't know what happened to her, right? That's right. That's right. That's that's that was as far as we knew the story. Yeah. How did Allison get involved? Tell the listeners out there what a piece of shit this woman is. So she was worried because uh the, the town was starting to lose interest in the story of this kidnapping. Mm-hmm. And so she starts to gin up uh, she composes an email essentially that is like, hey, uh, I have evidence that Benny Peterson, the hu- the father and husband of Heather, um, was the one who Crazy did Heather. this. Crazy Heather. Crazy Heather <laughs> was the one who did this. And basically the, the town and Chief Brimley built this case that was all based around circumstantial evidence. I, I, love, them, I love them in the flashback finding the paper, which is one of those like kind of news things that you put your money in to get them out on the street, the news di- newspaper dispensers things, which just so happened to be on a residential street because everything is on a residential street in yeah. fucking Slasher. It is so stupid. It's like they walk out the front door and they happen to have that new dis- <laughs> dispenser right in the front door. Oh, what? The camera has to duck people being like, hey, you want to come to the barbecue later? <laughs> no. Oh, you're, you're filming a whole scary show. Sorry. So fucking, like, it's so tawdry. But yeah, so essentially, like, the, the attention of the town is now focused on the dad. But you know what? Heather doesn't believe it. She sticks with her husband all the way through. Uh, it's just her husband, under mountain pressure, maybe takes matters into his own hand, fucking hangs himself. This is why yeah. Crazy Heather is Crazy Heather, by the way. Right. Oh, I'm now more sympathetic with that character than I've ever fucking been. Well, uh, you because... two, after all this shit, would be barking crazy shit in the middle of the town and spitting in envelopes and galleries. <laughs> right. Her her daughter goes missing. and Her then, business folds. Right. Her husband, who uh, Allison says was abusive and that's what makes all of this. Okay. Is yep. that he wasn't a great guy to begin with. Yep. Um, that her abusive husband then hangs himself under the shame and scrutiny of a murder investigation, mm-hmm. leaving her completely alone in this world. And as she confesses this, Lisa and fellows is like, all right, I'm pretty impressed. Guess you got the yeah, stuff. Like she's not horrified by it at all. It's like, yep, that's yeah. entry level one to being a big time journalist. Welcome to uh, journalism 101. And then she basically says to her, well, the question is, would you do it again? You know, I had to do it all over again. Would you do it again? And she's just like that. You know, I kept my paper around for another year and it paid salaries. And then she's like, buy this woman a drink. Now, she's already got a fucking full glass. She's like, get this woman a drink. And then the camera pins <laughs> hands up in that ominous, I'm about to give you another red herring show. Uh, get it, uh, flags up and Dylan is looking not impressed from the rafters bowl. Did he overhear it? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so speaking of maybe. Uh, yeah, let's follow the father. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the father, the son, and the sexy ghost. So... <laughs> Sarah and Robin, she is painting Robin. Like after she is drawing him horribly, by the way. Here is exactly what happened. Chief Brimley was like, You suck as an artist, goddammit. And she was like, I'll show him. I'll paint this fella. And so yeah. she gets Robin to sit for a portrait, and he's just like, This is taking forever, and you're My not nose very is good. Itchy. How long does it take? And this, by the way, is not how you paint someone. Like once you've got their profile, you can do the rest. You like right. work off your own artistic imagination to where the light is and all the rest. But no, she will not let him move and eventually has to scratch his nose. Although I will argue he's being very dramatic about scratching his nose. Says he's got fucking crabs and a forest fire or something up his nostril. Um and he starts clawing at it, and then as he stands up, he sees the father putting said kill kit in the back of his car to drive off, and they're like, ah, the game is a f- the game is a foot Sierra. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Indubitably. Right. Yeah. And so they, they take off after him because they're, you know, 
neighborhood sleuths. Yeah. And they so they follow in Robin's car all the way to uh like some building out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> in the middle of a residential street cuz it's right. uh, another, another, yet another residential street. And they're <laughs> So they're they they follow them inside and they hear screaming, and they rush upstairs to to in theory catch him in the act of murder. Because they hear they hear screams. This yeah. woman's like, "Oh no, I can't do it again. I can't do it. I won't do it again." And then they bust open the door, and it's like a scene from fucking Hellraiser three, right? Except more fun. Well, yeah. There's a cross there. There's only yeah. they're only bathed in a red neon light. <laughs> Right, it's like Nicholas winding ref and slasher for a second, <laughs> where it's it's all this red light uh, in the background, and it's like a dominatrix yep. pounding nails into Actually, his hands, making him like Jesus on the cross. <laughs> yeah, which is fine, but if there is any indication that this has happened more than one time ever, every then time I he washes his hands, it's like the dude from fucking Indiana Jones. Yeah. Right, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Da, 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 oh, yeah. Da, 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 oh, yeah. Da, da, da. He's only got one side of the nail. Yeah, um, like, it's so fucking stupid. It's so unrepentantly stupid. But they're like, oh, and he's like, oh, and right. then we're not going to see them for the rest of the episode. Instead. We're not even going to deal with it, actually, because we're going to go at the next day and we're still not going to be dealing with what was just seen. No, that's, a, that's an episode six thing. So yeah. an Al- uh, Allison is about to get on her plane to New York. Yep, she's got her backpack. The limo's a bit early. Spe- oh, God, speaking of stupid characters. So this limo <laughs> pulls up. The driver doesn't get out. She's like, hey, will you open the trunk? What about my bags? Yep. Wordlessly, the trunk opens. <laughs> He's like, oh, I can't open the books. <laughs> I'm sorry, you'll have to get your own bag. She's like, weird. He sounds kind of familiar. I'll just, I'll just do this. My shitty lip. I'm giving them a thumb down on trip advisor or whatever app we use for this. But she sits in the back and she's like, hmm. And the car drives off. Yeah. <laughs> the limo drives off. Yeah. And, and like, was was our mobile phone in the bit or something? Because you would imagine she's got her mobile phone in her boat. It's, it, you would think, but she sees, like, surprise, surprise, the executioner turns around. It was me all along that was the driver. <laughs> no, Bet you no. weren't expecting that when I never got out. And <laughs> and she's like, ah, oh my goodness. Comfortably in the limo. I was born in the limo, molded by it. <laughs> <laughs> and... So she wakes up at the old foundry again, all the, tied up to a chair. Yeah, because he has punched her right in the fucking face. Her nose is bloody. Yeah, and 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 finally, and she confesses. But again, you know, you confess to a serial killer tied to a chair. It is way yeah. too late to be confessing shit. Yeah, it's too late at this point. He's not going to let you go. And she's like, "I repent, I repent, I repent." And he lets her repent by, like I say, the, the maybe most humane kill we've had on this show yet for the most dastardly deed. Yeah. Her throat is slit. It, death bow. So they, <laughs> sorry, Alan in chat said, uh, uh, as a Canadian, Father Herring is related to Wolverine. It kind of made me laugh. <laughs> uh, <you're... laughs> anyway, but yeah, so the executioner just cuts her throat, slices her throat open. She bleeds out and done. I mean, she she's screaming when it happens, but again, that's way yeah, she's way also better. Screaming, she's screaming after her throat slit, which is not how that works. Sure, but at least that is a better way to go than being eaten alive by bugs and animals. And by shit. any other yeah. fucking measurable thing in here, all the nasty stuff that happens to her postmortem. Everyone else is like fucking Missy's cantankerous old boot across the road. Had her hands and legs, her feet chopped off while she was still alive. Yeah. So, all right. Speaking of. Yep. So, uh, very quick note, unless you have any details about this, um, is there's a quick bit where we see an officer show up, deliver DVDs of all the, (laughs) the sex tapes to Sarah. Cracks a joke that now he's a delivery guy. Yeah. And and this is what we mentioned earlier, where it turns out Tom Winston is in one of the videos. That's yeah. the big revelation here. You know, oh, to toy. To that, there's to the killer that. railing by mom there on on screen with everyone else. Yep. 
In answer to the, the, the comment just being posted in our chat, um, there is no way a chauffeur's cap is fitting over that reservoir tip. That's right. <laughs> kind of flop sided to the top, can't get on. Also, because of the hole I poked, I'll shoot it right off. <laughs> it's like putting this... a hat on one of the fountains at the Bellagio. <laughs> Is this is this a, is this what constitutes double bagging it? Oh, uh, I guess so. I guess so. Oh, it must be. He's yeah. Detected it. Uh, all right. So then we cut to some hipsters eating at a fast food place, uh, and I'm like, D are these new characters we need to? No, no. Slash is like, no, these oh, are disposable worry. characters. This is the worst setup for a. Uh, let like this character eat this calamari, which is not a calamari, boy. It's actually a. It's an ear. It's an Whoa. ear. Uh, oh no! And <laughs> hey, How? I <laughs> did that way back in Blue Velvet days. Wait, <laughs> let me answer this point because the next revelation is the police are there and they're checking through all the deep fryers. Some, right, I understand someone smuggling an ear right into a batch <laughs> yeah. of onion rings. They pull up. <laughs> A tree, and it's fucking Allison's filling. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's not even in like the basket. It's like under it or something, uncooked. By the way, <laughs> it, it, and also old oil. As someone who worked a couple of fast food jobs, oh, when I was yeah, in college, that is not clean oil. That is not clean oil. That looked dark. I mean, oh, man. I got a oh. lot of questions about the the health, uh, the situation. hygiene, just in general of this place. But they pull the head out, and they're like, "Oh, yeah." That is so, just, like, Chief Bradley had a fucking shitty day, and all he wants to do is get home. But Dylan's going to be all over him, like white on rice, and um, like, and he gets out this fucking door and. Dylan is far too giddy that Allison might be the potential, you know, victim here. Right, it's a whole like, hey, could you confirm that it's Allison in, inside the building? He's just like, listen, God damn it, 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 I just got here. I'm trying to make sense of everything. Why you got to be so goddamn nosy? And it, but it, it, does, it does say the line, you know, that, you know, I thought you worked with her and he's like that. Is that you admitting that the victim in there is actually, actually that of Allison. And then we get this thing that I've never understood in, in TV and movies, and they all do it, and I fucking hate it. Like, conversations that take place clearly after a vehicle has left. Yeah, Like, yeah. he's shouting, but he continues to shout after the vehicle is gone. And like that, no one hears that. Is that just because you don't like to leave things unfinished or whatever? But he's like, you either you get involved with me and we can do this story together, or report them all own way. Yeah. And meanwhile, Chief Bribley's like three miles away. <laughs> She's home already. And he has the most charming wife ever who's out in the garden singing songs. And she's like, Brimley, do you want me to make you a sandwich? Yeah, and it's like, do you want pastrami or salami? And I'm like, man, yeah. pastrami sandwich. That's a... I was like, my mouth warmed. I know. She said oh, that. man. And, and Brimley's like, oh, go, 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 go. What I wouldn't give her a pastrami on Swiss right now, Duncan. Mm. You know, grilled, maybe a little kraut. Dear God. Anyway, so he, yeah, he gets home. He goes to his den down in the man cave. Which I love this man cave. This man cave has, wait for it, a safe for his guns and all mm -hmm. that, which makes sense. Sure. Then it has a fridge on the other side of the room. And I was like, well, you, to me, just mm -hmm. knowing how I would like a room, I'd have the two things beside each other. But I walk to the end of the room to get my beer. He takes the cap off, and then the most human thing that has happened in this show it just leaves it hanging around because that's what people do they don't he, put it he puts it on top of a shelf and i think there were a couple more under uh, up yeah, there that's, i was like oh his, that's his beer cap shelf yeah um, like, so he leaves it there and then he goes over to what at first i thought was a wall and then he starts unlocking a lot of things and i was like that mm, this is kind of strange <laughs> what's going on here and then he walks into a locked room in his house like a basement subcompartment into the room. movie the room yes which is literally the movie the room and bo we get our final revelation of this episode about chief brimley yeah tell our dear listeners the the slab of well-placed well-articulated well-crafted storytelling that this is so he walks in because and, and there's a girl singing to a little boy Mm -hmm. clearly well not clearly this appears to be the child's mother yes also this it happens is ariel the girl who went missing years ago that 
got the uh, you know it was blamed on benny peterson who murdered mm-hmm. himself and made mm-hmm. heather go crazy mm-hmm. chief Brimley the whole time is like guess what god damn it secret weirdo <laughs> that's me <laughs> and so <laughs> he's kidnapped her but no is he kidnapped her he has fathered the child as well does he say that or is that well, just the implication the kid, well the kid says father and he kind of oh, looks yeah. lovingly at her so either he has right either there's a backstory here and that area was being abused by her dad and he saved her question mark don't think that's the case but the kid refers to him as dad yeah and he said with his beer looking lovingly as his abducted child bride sits singing to her chair yeah it's all fucking twist. weird it's a twist and then, duncan and then the show finishes and i actually finished this episode this morning i was sitting at my dining room table and my wife was sitting at the other side of the table and my child was at the end of the room and the words oh fuck off came out my mouth (laughs) i was like come on uh, all right alan has asked uh for uh my vc andrews loving face when this happened (laughs) it was this (laughs) so there you go it was it was confusion a little bit of anger um you know it's just it, right it, this this series continues to be like the fu- like it it has twists for the sake of twists it's a soap opera this is yeah. what i'm saying it is literally a soap opera what that you should have the climactic music all the cameras shocked at the screen cut to fucking credits next week we'll find out who the real dad is it's just it's pantomime and it's- i, I, I I just can't be there. There's so many horrible things in one little town. <laughs> it there, doesn't make sense. Oh. Is there, wait, are, are there eight episodes this season? There's still three episodes to go. Okay. So we have, in theory, we have a, a, a solid two-ish hours yep. of of Slasher Left. Yep. Or of season one of Slasher Left. And we are realistically we have... going to find out that the sheriff was behind all this. Dylan is a horrible fucking... See if they try and redeem the Dylan character, I'm going to be pissed off. Cam could be the potential killer. The father loves fucking nail bondage. Um, yeah, I, think, I don't think he's head. the killer. I don't think it's oh, actually God, Tom no, The father is not the killer. Um, I think we're going to find that the serial killer isn't her dad, or maybe is the dad. Who the fuck cares at this point? Um, we need to find out about Dylan's backstory, about why he was messaging the serial killer all along we've not even touched on that it's been two episodes since we talked about that last yeah so that's bound to come back and then duncan i mean well i would like to think (laughs) and then the chief is going to be discovered as being like the chief is out the next episode we've set up that knowing how this show's written he's going to be abducted by the the executioner next time around which means someone knew about this in order to do it and did nothing on the run-up to this, but I think what we'll find out is the executioner is actually related to this entire case, and not against Sarah's case. Of Right, of course. Of course. Which is, it's been, that has been the big red herring all along, Bo. It's been playing 3D chess. Oh, you don't, you don't want to say that the show Slasher outsmarted you. That's like, that's no. just a thing that hurts, it hurts your head and your heart. it outdumbed me. I think that's what it is. I think it outdumbed me. I think it's dumber than I thought it was going to be. I think I gave it too much credit. <laughs> um, look, in two weeks' time, these questions and more will be answered. Or perhaps not. That's oh. the beauty of Slasher, <laughs> is that maybe we'll never know. And and that's kind of nice uh, to, to feel a little bit like there's a sense of mystery in the world, mm-hmm. I suppose. Um, look, let's get this out of the way. Folks, thank you so much for... <laughs> Uh, uh for watching and listening if you are listening to the audio version of this um and i've been having a blast watching i I know we talk about how dumb this show is but i'm having so much fun talking about it <laughs> it is it is truly stupid in a way that i really really enjoy and uh and in between now and the next two weeks in which we we speak uh duncan tell people where they can find you and what's going on Yep, you can check me out on the podcast under the stairs. If you search podcast under the stairs anywhere, you will get the show. The website is tputzcast.com. That's T P U T S C A S T. Dot com. That's where you can get access to every show I do. There is an episode of Opera Omnia up there just now where me and Bo discuss seven. One of my favourite conversations of this year podcasting was that episode. It's great. So please go and check that out. And on Podcast Under the Stairs, by the time this episode drops, 
um, you will have the E24 part two episode where we discuss Ghost Story, It Comes at Night, uh, Killing of a Sacred Deer, Hereditary, um, Under the Silver Silver Lake. Lake. And there's one more that I can't remember. The monster? Did you say the monster? The monster, yeah. The Brian Bertino movie, The Monster. So yeah, all six of those movies reviewed on that episode. Myself, Bo and Jamie. And if it's a patch on the last recording, you are in for a treat. So tbutzcast.com. Yes, I, th- I think that's going to be super fun. I'm I'm enjoying both of those series, both the A24 and the Opera, mm. Opera Omnia. That Opera Omnia series uh, this year with the the David Fincher, I would be listening to it anyway, but it yeah. it is one of my absolute favorite things to do now is to have a conversation about a David Fincher movie at length. It is. Yeah. And, and once, as a, once a month is just a pure joy. You know what I mean? It feels like we're treating ourselves. Too it, well. Yeah, it kind of <laughs> does. And people have pointed out, uh, like, Oh, did you know, you guys didn't talk about this. It's like, yeah, I know we talked for almost two hours and it's not, we can't cover Enough. everything because it's yeah. You, can, you physically can, you can yeah. honestly dedicate a whole season of a show just to dissect and the, the stuff that is actually in the movie seven. Yeah. It's that dense and packed. Um, and you can do that with all Fincher stuff, and that's the joy of it, is we won't get to everything, but we will get to the bits that, you know, are, like, immediately needing to be addressed on those shows. So, right. yeah, ton of fun. Everyone should be checking it out. Uh, and and so, uh, on my end of things, you can check out uh, pick6movies.com. If you're watching this live, a new episode will be dropping on Friday um uh featuring kiss meets the phantom of the park which is a notoriously terrible film um <laughs> and and it's worse than you imagine if you've never seen it kiss meets the phantom of the park is worse than you think it's going to be um so uh pick six movies continues uh that season by the way called a flop is born all about musicians trying to make their way into the movie industry oh god and uh <laughs> boy we the lineup we have duncan <laughs> is staggering staggering i want to give it away but it's some of the like, it's the stuff that when i bought it i had to buy a couple of these things on ebay and there was a uh, i got an email that was like hey are you you want this dvd right mm-hmm. i'm just following up before i send it to you i want to make sure like we don't we don't get many requests for these. <laughs> um, so there's some of that coming. Anyway, so that's Pick 6 Movies. Um, also, Hero Hero Go Show is back on the regular. The Eye uh, ha- is out now. Um, mm-hmm. uh, looking at that movie. The Eye 2 will be dropping uh, Saturday as well, a week from today. Um, and then LegionPodcasts.com. Well, I mean, Duncan Boke, I'm correct. You're watching that. but uh, And then LegionPodcasts.com. Uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, uh, new shows that I'm not on, but there's a, a Mystery Vault podcast that just dropped an episode about Big Feats, um, a, a, as has been mentioned, uh, and Loch Ness Monsters and whatnot. You can get mm-hmm. the, the skinny on that. Turns turns out, Duncan, might not be real. I mean, uh, the tourist trade in Scotland would spit in your face for saying that, Bora, and still how dare you. <laughs> well, yeah, hey, take it up with RJ. He's the one doing that show. Um, what I'm saying is Americans keep coming over and spending all your money. <laughs> yeah, they whooped your head real good. Anyway. <laughs> real good. Um, and, and also a couple of things I would point out over there in addition to all the new shows uh and and stuff uh and, that you can catch up with and subscribe to and and that kind of thing and and so thank you so much for doing any and all of that um also we have a patreon i point that out because there is a new monthly show on our patreon feed called the ouija experiment experiment in which uh myself and a rotating series of hosts um <laughs> yes laurie there are legion shows i'm not on i'm only on like two of them and we've got like 16 shows um but uh, the ouija experiment experiment is myself in a rotating series of hosts looking at movies that happen to have ouija in the title it is a very thin rationalization for me to watch these movies that i would watch anyway uh but we we look at through look at them through the hard lens of science to determine whether or not these movies are in fact successful films at a very basic level just are these movies that's really the science we're conducting and mo- in most cases no most no, cases the no, answer is yeah. no <laughs> um so uh if you were uh, the the first episode is on patreon now it's a video podcast like this one 
uh, except my background is a laboratory because it's science happening on that yes. show. Science. And uh, so the first episode on the Ouija experiment, the movie The Ouija Experiment, is out now. Uh, we will be recording for March the Ouija Experiment Experiment, uh, uh, the Ouija Experiment 2 theater of blood or ghosts or something theater or something <laughs> uh which was another movie that i had to order on like you can't stream it anywhere and i had to i had to track down a copy of the ouija experiment too which is something that i will forever regret on my deathbed <laughs> um so that's that's all all the stuff that's going on on legion pod not all the stuff it's a fraction really of the stuff going on mm -hmm. legion podcast these days doing a lot of shit um and and list the list of legends is going on uh which is a, a tremendous amount of fun so anyway check all that stuff out a lot of stuff um nothing else duncan we're we're, we're gonna be gone for two weeks be back uh with another live episode in two weeks time mm -hmm. uh until then there is nothing left to say but say good night duncan there's nothing left to say but say good night duncan oh bye <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> oh.